השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, back here in Aventura, another שיעור in the מוסר פרקי אבות סיריז, ברוך השם, we are up to שיעור number 110, and uh, it seems like the שיעור we did, the two שיעורים we did last week, on anger, got a lot more feedback than a typical shiur. Baruch Hashem, all shiurim have something, whether it's the Pirkei Avot series or uh, the uh, Amazing Questions series we did on Sunday, had a lot of fire in it. Uh, every shiur, Baruch Hashem, has something. But uh, the anger shiur apparently got uh, more people riled up than, than the norm, meaning more people riled up in a positive way. More people admitted that they have a lot, uh, a lot of work to do when it comes to tshuva, because a lot of things that were said by the sages during that uh, shiur were uh, hit home. The Torah became relevant to your specific life in a second. The Torah told the whole story of your life, and I'm saying this to myself. In a second, in a second, your whole life was, oh, beginning, middle, end, your whole life. One verse, one, one, one pasuk, one mishnah, your whole life. So, when you see that something is working, you got to keep doing it. So I actually had uh, some siyat dishmaya today uh, that uh, seems like we need to do a part three. Seems like we need to continue a little bit more, even though I studied mostly the uh, the next Mishnah, which uh, has to do with uh, students, the types of students, and also how to get Ruach HaKodesh. Anybody interested in getting Ruach HaKodesh? Bezat Hashem, we're going to get there. Bezat Hashem, we're going to get there. It's attainable. I have instructions. I got it from my Rav. I got the instructions of how to get to Ruach HaKodesh. Not like the... Uh, the, the, the heretics, Avdeh Avodah Zarah, idol worshippers, Christians, say they have Ruach HaKodesh. Every, every, every two days, somebody over there has Ruach HaKodesh. Uh, and actually, you'll see the definition of Ruach HaKodesh and how to attain it, that you'll see why all of the people, not, not with all exception, every single person on earth today that says he has it, you'll see by, for sure he doesn't have it, just based on the instructions. But Bezat Hashem will get there. Depends. Depends how much material we have, how much siyat nishmai we have on, on the anger issue. You see, the thing is, with, with, uh, with Torah, since it has nothing really to do with you, and really when you're teaching, you're just volunteering to be a vessel. You're just volunteering to, to if you're teaching lishma, if you're teaching for, for the sake of Hashem, not teaching because you want money or because you want popularity or something. If you're teaching Lishma, you're teaching for Hashem's sake to sanctify His name, then in essence what you're saying is that I'm volunteering my body to repeat what Hashem said. That's it. Or you become, you become a tuki. You become a parrot. And uh, Hashem gives you the words, Baruch Hashem. And you know, because if it was up to me, I would have quit a long time ago. I'll tell you a story. The... Shurim, for the most part, for the last several years we've been doing this, for most of them have been in uh, English. I did a few, maybe 30, 40, 50 shurim in Hebrew. Uh, but, but most of my shurim are, 90% of my shurim, Baruch Hashem, have been in English. Uh, but uh, we did a few in Hebrew. And Hebrew is much more difficult for me. Um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, after you spend... 75% of your life and 100% of your adult life, uh, you know, speaking English, even though I was born with Hebrew as my first language, it's no longer your first language. So communicating in the beginning was very difficult because I stopped speaking Hebrew 30 years ago and then I only started speaking again after doing tshuva. So yes, I don't have an accent, and people think that I, I just came off the boat yesterday when I speak Hebrew and everything, but the reality is it's different. It's not as developed. The, the language itself is not as developed as the uh, Baruch uh, 
as the uh, English language. The vocabulary is very different, much lower, and so on. So it took a while to work on it. Um, but the bigger reason is, is because the Israeli crowd is very different than you guys. It's very different. You're civilized, you hear, you're quiet, you're listening. When you want to talk, you raise your hand. You're nice about it. Israelis are not always the same. They're not always that way. Israeli doesn't like what you say, he'll tell you on the spot. And he'll make sure you hear it. And he'll make sure your mother hears it also. And whoever knows you is going to hear it also. He makes sure you heard it. Why? He doesn't like what you said. Why? Mechalel Shabbat Montimad. Who said? Show me. Very passionate people. Fiery people. The good thing is, is that the fiery people are easy to make them do tshuva. The fiery people shows they have a heart. They care. It bothers them. Those people, much easier to make them do tshuva. But it means that you have to, you have to fight. Mamash. You have to fight. If you fight good, you win. You win, you get people to do tshuva, you get a whole room, 500 people to do tshuva. I remember there was a shiur in Israel, uh, maybe, maybe 100 guys in the shiur, young kids, say uh, maybe 75% of them Ethiopian kids, nice, cute kids. The others were all different, Eidot, uh, some Ashkenazi, most of them Sfaradim though. After this year, you would have thought, I would have thought myself, if I didn't know myself, I would have thought I was Mashiach. Everybody did tshuva. Shtabach shimolad. Everybody did tshuva. It's unbelievable. Like, it's just one after another. You know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to start learning, I'm going to start this, I'm going to do this, take this, take this, everything. Unbelievable. So, what I did, when I did a shurim in, in uh, maybe three years ago, four years ago. Somebody invited me to do a shiur at somebody's house in Hebrew. And uh, I was just still early on, maybe four years ago even, three, four years ago, he invited me to a house to do a shiur as a group of young people in their 20s. All just came, you know, most of them came uh, to the U.S. within, uh, f- you know, a month to five years, like a short period of time. And all were looking for themselves and so on and so forth. The, the, the Balabite was a nice guy, not religious, thought it was interesting but not religious no one was religious with the exception of the guy that uh invited me he was like somewhat 50 50 religious anyway i went i started talking and uh said the same things that i've been telling you guys just less organized like i am today I and mean, you have experience and every word that came out of my mouth somebody wanted to chop my head off Every word, a mamash, with no exception. And the worst part is, the guy that invited me was the, it was the worst one. The one that invited me was the worst one. Every two seconds, he'd interrupt me. Every two seconds. Yeah, but you pronounce this word this way. Okay, you pronounce, what difference does it make? Oh, yeah, but it says, but this, eh, uh, you know, it was mamash for me, kaparat avonot. After I finished the shiur, I mean, it, some people got riled up, and uh, I thought maybe we got somewhere, but... If it was up to me, I would have never done the shiur. After I left the shiur, I thought, what a waste of time. Mamash, a waste of time. Let me just focus on my English-speaking crowd. Much easier. They don't want to eat my head off. At least they do it online instead of doing it in my face. You know? So I just, uh, you know, I spoke to a few people after the shiur. We had some nice conversations, but me, I looked at it. I said, Mamash, if anything, I made things worse for them. Why? I tell the guy, Michal Shabbat Mot He didn't like to hear it. He wanted to uh, blame me for it. Like I wrote the Torah. Wasting seed. I told him, wasting seed. He goes, What do you mean? All of us are doing it. I said, Okay, so stop. He goes, Wait, stop. You stop. I said, <laughs> tough. Tough crowd. So I thought I wasted my time. Hashem says when he's happy with a person, even his enemies that come say, I'm sorry. They come make peace with him. So a few months ago I heard from somebody, that the guy actually that uh, invited me to that shiur told me something. He's like, yeah, one of the guys really got stronger and so on. After the shiur, I said, I didn't really believe it. So oh, it sounds nice. I didn't really believe it. 
I go to the store on Friday to do some Shabbat shopping, and a uh, young guy comes up to me, Israeli guy, got a little beard on, you know, like a Baal Tshuva beard, brand new, right off the box. He's like, you remember me? I said, uh, Baal Hashem, I remember his name. I don't remember anybody's name. I remember his name. I'm like, yeah, you, huh? He said, I said, wow, Baal Hashem, you got kippah, you got a little beard, you got everything, you look tzaddik. He goes, yeah, you don't understand what happened after the shoe. I thought about things. I did shoe. I've been learning ever since at the yeshiva in Hollywood over there. I rubbed my hose. I've been learning over there, uh, you know, a few times a week, to 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 everything. The guy did shuva. I never heard from him again. Three, four years, I haven't heard from the guy. One shoe, he did shuva. One shoe, that's it. Finished. One shoe. This is Klal Yisrael. This is Am Yisrael. This is why it's so upsetting that when you see speakers afraid to tell people the truth because maybe they're going to get turned off. Because the reality is that Klal Yisrael, they're all like this. All you got to do is just say the right thing and that's it, the fire's back on. I don't know how many more people did shuvah from that shiur or not, but it doesn't make a difference. One guy did shuvah and a shiur that in my personal opinion was the worst shiur I ever did. In my opinion, the worst shiur I ever did. If it was up to me, I would have erased it. But now, I see it's uh, the best shiur. You understand? So, that's the thing. When, when, when you're speaking and you tell people the truth about Torah, and you tell them exactly what Hashem says without uh, poisoning it, with your own personal opinion, because that's what it is. Your own personal opinion is 100% poison. It's Yetzara poison. It's like venom. Venom. Just think, your opinion, venom. Try to inflict less pain on the public with your personal poison. And, uh, and that's actually the problem with a lot of people that teach today. The majority of the shiur, whatever they call a shiur these days, is venom. It's their personal opinion. Why? Because they think their personal opinion is easier and softer and more fit for Klal Yisrael, and that's what's going to work for them. You tell Yisrael, they're not going to listen. They're gonna, not going to come back anymore. You tell Klal Yisrael that if you're homosexual, they, they, they kill you. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's turn, it turns them off. What turns them off? The guy's homosexual. How much more off do you want him to be? The guy's marrying a Goya. He's married to a Goya. She's married to a Goy. Ten years already. They have three kids. How much more off do you want it to be? It's upsetting. So, the issue is though, is that, Baruch Hashem, you get certain people to do tshuva. Like I have this other guy, also came to one shiur. Happens to be American. American Jew, I think one of his parents is Israeli, so maybe that's why it has happened this way. He came to one shiur in Boca. One shiur in Boca. I was still having the shiurim in my house. Somebody invited him. Came to one shiur. I had a shiur, and he started asking questions right off the bat. Oh, what if you don't know? What if you don't this? I have a, actually, I made a couple of clips out of that shiur. I told him, ignorance doesn't absolve you from the, uh, from the punishment. If you're ignorant about the speed limit, does it absolve you from punishment? No. They still give you a ticket for a million dollars. If they can, whatever is legal. And even if it's not legal, they're still going to try to get you for it. What are you thinking, Shemaim, it's any different? You're going to say, oh, I didn't know. And say, oh, you didn't know? Okay, I'm sorry, don't worry about it. Okay, so you lived 70 years going against Hashem, being an enemy of Hashem, 24 hours a day. And you didn't know? Oh, okay, no problem. No problem. You were a Nazi? You were a Nazi against Hashem? For 70 years and you didn't know you were a Nazi? Oh, okay, it's okay, it's okay. Oh, you murdered? How many people you murdered? Okay, I'm sorry. we'll give them all I'm about to with you. Who thinks like this? So that's why Rabotai, when I um, when I give shoes, I give I give people an understanding that there's no efkirut, there's no there's no uh, discounts here, there's no uh, freebies, if you will. And he started asking questions. And I saw he's really interested. I was disappointed because I never saw him again. He didn't come back the next week. He didn't come back for a little while. One day I get a text message from him. Oh, listen, I really want him interested. Send me something, a book or 
a lecture or something, I start seeing the guy starting to do tshuva. Little do I know, all it took is one shiur. That's it, he did tshuva. One shiur, he came to one shiur, he did tshuva. Unbelievable. Mamash, unbelievable. Some people, all they need is just to light the fire, they're going to continue. Now, of course, there's a lot more that's needed. One shiur is not enough. You need to continue learning, so he's learning from books, he's watching a shiur him online. Same thing with the other guy. He actually started, continued learning with a different rabbi, Rabbi Maoz in, uh, in Hollywood. It was very good. Um, the point is you have to continue. There's, a, there's, a, uh, you know, there's the initial shock, a reality check. But then there's the follow-up treatment. The follow-up treatment, do you know how long it continues for? Forever. Forever. That's the time frame. It's a forever plan. So, when it comes to Telling people the truth, that means that you have to be willing to put yourself in an uncomfortable position. And it has a lot to do with our Mishnah, it has a lot to do with our topic today, it has a lot to do with our world today, it has to do a lot with the Mashiach, it has to do a lot with everything. Because as you tell more and more people the truth about Hashem Barach, you start seeing people make face at you. Ah, I don't think it means that. What do you mean? It says mot yumat, death upon death. There's no other way to translate it. Even in Arabic, it means the same thing. Like whatever you want in a different language, in Greek, same thing. The Chinese people say, no, you're dangerous. <laughs> mot yumat, you guys are going to die if you <laughs> keep Shabbat. Well, what do you want? It's what it says. There's no other way to translate it. The people in Korea are studying, studying Gemara. They're saying, you guys don't keep Shabbat, you have a problem. In Korea, they're studying Gemara. So, there's no other way. Tell people the truth, they're going to start looking at you like you have eight eyes. Why? Because it obligates them. It op- the, the truth obligates people. So they're going to try to justify their behavior in different ways. One way is by telling you you're wrong. Once you prove that you're right, then they're going to tell you, yeah, but there's different faces to the Torah. There's 70 faces to the Torah. Maybe there's a different meaning also, which actually shows their lack of knowledge about Torah, is that even if something has multiple meanings, it never negates the pshat. It never negates the basic meaning. Like, all you're doing is that you're saying there's another meaning on top of this. It means, let's say, if it means death, and it also means in this world, but it also means death in the next world. So it's not, it doesn't change the basic uh, pshat. The basic message never changes. You're just adding to it. So the people that say, oh, no, that there's 70 faces of the Torah, that's why it could mean something else, clearly shows that they don't know any of those faces. Why? Because they assume that just because there's more than one meaning, that the original meaning... It's not really the meaning. It's negated. It goes, goes in, a, in a wastebasket because it doesn't fit their life. It doesn't fit their approach. Or they start mentioning completely irrelevant issues, which is actually a Christian system. This is the Christian start of the strategy. And unfortunately, some of us, of Bnei Israel are doing the same thing today, where you show a proof, and instead of saying, yeah, yeah, you're right, oh, yeah, I'm wrong, or anything like that, what do they say? They mention something completely off topic. It's like, yo, look, Moshe Rabbeinu came down, Mount Sinai, there was millions of witnesses, you can't doubt it. No one ever says that he didn't come. He was there, it says a Pasuk. Yeah, but what do you think about Isaiah 53? What does it have to do with anything, did I ask you? But what do you think they, uh, what do you think Moshe Rabbeinu's favorite food was? What does it have to do with anything? I just told you about Mount Sinai. Do you think they had dentists in those days? What do you think of the red cow? What does it have to do with anything with Mount Sinai? I'm talking about Mount Sinai right now. I'm saying they got the Ten Commandments. First three commandments between us and Hashem. Only one, he's the only God, took us out of Egypt. Don't worship idols. Don't use his name in vain. Fourth commandment, you have, don't be Mechal Shabbat. That's what I'm talking about right now. Yeah, but um, what do you think about when the Rambam wrote... The Morene Vuchim, the guy that was perplexed, and a lot of people went against him. What does that have to do with anything I'm saying? 
What does that have to do with Shabbat? What does that have to do with Ten Commandments? No, it just shows, you know. What, what does it show? What does it show? It's tough. It's tough. Did you understand anything I just said? No, neither did I. This is these people. This is these people. I'm dealing with this for the last couple of days. We had a, a clip come out about how we made a connection. Siat Dishmaya Mamash, Hashem gave us an idea. It's unbelievable. How the Gemara said when a person, a person gets angry, gets angry, the Gemara in Masichet Shabbat says a person gets angry if he acts on it, if he acts on his anger, everybody gets angry, but if he acts on it, meaning he takes something and he throws it, he curses, he uses derogatory language, he's uh, abusive, he acts out his anger. He is bound to eventually, according to the Gemara, become an idol worshiper. Why? Because already, once you become angry, that means you're human. That's fine. But once you've actually taken that anger and you've acted on it, that means you've agreed to obey what the Satan has told you to do. The Satan has just officially become your boss. He became your boss. And the Gemara says, first he does this, then he does this, then he does this. Eventually, the Satan's going to tell him, what? Go become an idol worshiper. Go become an idol worshiper. So, the issue here is that we see that the Satan, his job is to constantly get you further and further from Hashem, to be the resistance. Now, we did a shiur about a year ago in New York about drugs, the drug addictions in the world. What is it? Uh, what's allowed? What's not allowed? How there's a very big confusion uh, among society today of what's good and what's bad for you and how the, the line is getting blurrier and blurrier where just because, let's say, for example, a marijuana has medical benefits, people assume that it's allowed to do it re- recreationally. No one is saying that the medical benefits is forbidden. If something has medical benefits and you need it because you are sick, you have uh, AIDS, you have cancer, barminan, you have uh, back aches, you have, I don't know, you have some type of, I understand. Listen, the Torah understands. The Torah says, Hashem gave us the rules for what? To live by them. To live. Why? Use these rules in order to live. Which means that if something is good for your health, do it. No problem. But people take Torah, they take one word from the Torah, they add a bunch of garbage to it, they say, oh, this is from the Torah. No, no, this is from you. This is your venom. You used one, the, the Torah has one word, you used 5,000 words, you say, no, but it says end. It says end in the Torah, it says end over here, nah. it's the same thing. What same thing? Would you do the same thing if you were a, uh, in the stock market business? You were putting a prospectus together for a new e- initial public offering? For a new company coming out. Oh, we have a brand new product. What's the brand new product? And, wait a minute. Hey, sir, sir, sir. Hey, hey, hold on a second. You just stole the patent from Coca-Cola. No, no, no. We have something different. What? Look at our paragraph. It's the same thing as Coca-Cola. You're right. But we have the word end. We have the word end in ours. So it's different. Something wrong with you? You go to jail for such things. So people manipulate and pervert the truth. So, when it comes to the Torah, there's only a single version of the truth. Of course, there's multiple opinions and certain things, but they're both true, if they follow the rules. The Torah says, if we follow the Yetzirah, we're bound to eventually worship an idol. Why? Because that's the furthest from the truth. That's the furthest from Hashem. It's the furthest place from Hashem. If you see the first verse in the Torah, Bereshit bara elokim. Bereshit bara elokim. In the beginning, Hashem created. The last letter of each one of those words, Bereshit taf bara alif elokim mem. If you take Aleph, Mem, and Taf, what do you spell? Emet. What's Emet? Emet is the signature of Hashem. The signature of Hashem. So now, Rabotai Karim, Hashem says there's a single truth. If you follow the Yetzirah because of your anger, eventually 
you are going to become an idolater. Now, how do we connect it to drugs? Rav Moshe Feinstein, Allah Shalom, said that the person that uses marijuana recreationally, recreationally, for fun, i.e., for fun, he likes it. He listened to uh, Drog Kasuto. He listened to Drog Kasuto and said, that before you learn Torah, smoke some drugs. Smoke some marijuana. It makes you feel good. He listened to uh, all of these uh, people that uh, use their venom to teach. And uh, he says, uh, you, could dr- you could smoke drugs. You're doing it, if you don't, again, if it's medical, you're a different story. We're talking about recreational. Uh, Moshe Feinstein said, even if you're using it for medical purposes, even if you're using it for medical purposes, if the medicine alters your state of mind, like marijuana does, you're only allowed to use it if it's the only option. If there's another option that does not alter your state of mind, like an Advil pill or something like that, then you have to use that. You cannot use marijuana. Yeah, but I like it better. That's too bad. Too bad you like it better. Of course you like it better. You want to get high. But now, if you use, if you don't follow Da Torah, you don't follow the opinion of the Torah, and you go smoke marijuana recreationally. We're not even talking about cocaine and heroin. That's a kalvachon. I need this to say. We're talking, or, or, or painkillers. If you have pain, you need painkillers, use painkillers. But if you don't have pain, you use painkillers. You're a drug addict. You're a junkie. So now, what does it mean to be a junkie in Torah? Junkie means, according to Rav Moshe Feinstein, you have decided to remove your mind. You, be, you have decided to intentionally make yourself a drunk, a shote. And a shote is a person that's pasul for mitzvot. He's not allowed, he can't do mitzvot. Someone that's a shote, someone that's a drunk, is not allowed to pray to Hashem. Can't come to Beknesset and pray to Hashem. If you're drunk, you're not allowed to pray to Hashem when you're drunk. How do we know? Two of the holiest people in history, the two sons of Aaron Cohen, Nadav and Aviu, Moshe Rabbeinu himself said, I think they're bigger than me and you, Aaron. I think they're bigger than you. Me and you together. Nadav and Aviu. They went to Kodesh Kodeshim right after they had a little sip, a little Lechaim. What did Hashem do? He killed both of them. Two sons of Aaron Cohen. Aaron Cohen. They saw, they saw the words of God. They heard God. They were prophets. They were Kohanim. They had a little Lechaim. Went to Kodesh Kodeshim. Hashem killed them. Needless to say, we're not allowed to have a uh, nice shot of Arak before we go uh, do Mincha. Like some people do this. I don't know why. I don't know why the rabbis don't say anything. In some of these Batek Neset, they have liquor in the actual shul and people drink in the shul right before they pray, during the prayer. Shem Achem. You don't realize you're bringing a death penalty to yourself. A death penalty. And then people get surprised. Oh, I don't know why I got cancer. Oh, I don't know why I got an accident on the way home. You're lucky you're alive to say the story. So now, when a person is a shote, when a person drinks alcohol, or he smokes marijuana, or he takes painkillers, or whatever other drug, recreationally, what Moshe Feinstein says, he is now a shote, which is pasul for mitzvot. He's not allowed to fulfill mitzvot at that point. Now, since he did it intentionally, he is in the same madrega, he's in the same level, is a ben sorer umore. What's a ben sorer umore? Ben sorer umore is the wayward son that wants to eat too much and drink too much and do all types of bad things to go against his parents. And the Torah says, him, we kill him. We kill him. Well, he's only a kid though. He's not even 18. He's a little kid. He's 12 years old. Yeah, yeah, we kill him. What do you mean you kill him? Why? He says it's better to kill him while he's still a kid. And he's, his sins are small because if he's already going against his own parents at this age, he's drinking, he's doing drugs, he's doing all these things already at this age, it's only a matter of time before he does it against the Shem. It's better to kill him now. Kill him while he still has some merits in Shemaim. Maybe he'll come back as a reincarnation and become a better person. 
Now, in practical, in, in reality, the Chazal says this never actually happened. But it is a rule in our Torah, which means that it would have happened if the, if the opportunity uh, took place. The point being, Rabotai, is the rule apparently was taught to us. Not for the kid 3,000 years ago, but to us. How? Well, Moshe Feinstein says, if you smoke drugs, you are that kid. Yeah, but I'm 25. Exactly. Yeah, but I'm 50. Exactly. You are that kid that if the Sanhedrin were there, they'd kill you on the spot for smoking marijuana. It'd kill you on the spot for having a lechaim right before you went to Mincha. So, now, how did this disconnect? That the Ben Soer More, one of the main things, they had certain character traits that were horrible. One of the main things is that the parents brought him to the, rab- to the rabbis. Why? Because he's an angry person. He doesn't want to listen to them. And the rabbi said, if he's this angry at this age, we have to kill him. He's going to get much worse. He's going to go against the Shem. He's going to become an idol worshiper. He said, ah, that's what I understand. That's where the Gemara is talking about. If you get angry, eventually you're going to become an idol worshiper. If you get angry, you're going to become an idol worshiper. So how do we connect it to marijuana today? I said to people, listen, look at what the Gemara is telling us 2,000 years ago. If you start with something small, you're going to get to something much bigger. Marijuana, I don't, have, I don't need to tell anybody how marijuana is usually the first drug every crackhead started with. Every junkie started with marijuana. No one starts with crack, at least not uh, uh, typical. No uh, junkie starts with it. Trust me, I know a bunch of them. I try to help a lot of them. And Baruch Hashem, many of them succeeded. I know, I know a lot about this. It's not, I'm not saying, saying things out of opinion. I'm telling you actual reality. So now, the Torah tells us it's going to become an idol worshiper. So how? Look at what's happening. Today, every single person that goes into drugs and becomes addicted, unfortunately, he doesn't intend to become addicted. No one intends to become addicted, but he falls into it. Misken, he has a yetzara. You feel bad for him, you try to help him. But what happens? What does the Satan do? Satan tells him, listen, your addiction, your addiction, it's a disease. It's not your choice anymore. It's a disease. You're addicted. An addiction, you can't get over it. That means you have to continuously get treatment forever. Where do you get treatment? Go to AA. Where is the AA? In a church. What do they do in a church? They worship idols. And that's how marijuana leads to idolatry. Because these AA meetings and being in churches, it's also the number one place of where missionaries hang out. It's their house. Missionaries hang out and steal souls day and night. And that's how the Torah already told us thousands of years ago of how doing something that you think is small eventually is going to lead you to Abu Dazara. And people didn't like this. Why didn't they like it? Because they're still crackheads. Because they don't like it. No, no, but uh, AA is also good. I'm not saying it's, uh, it's, it's not good. I'm saying the church is bad. If the AA meeting was held at some auditorium or it's held at a... Uh, at a uh, synagogue, or it's held at an office, no problem at all. But that's the problem. It's not in an office. It's not in a synagogue. It's at a church where the missionaries hang out. So people don't like to hear this. They don't like to hear this. They want to, to, to pervert the truth because it doesn't fit their reality. But such is the Yetzirah where one day you agree to be his employee for the day. He says, no, no, you're full time now. You're full. Yeah, I didn't want a full-time job. Sorry, you signed a deal. Where? Over there. You don't see? Oh, we signed for you. Don't worry. We signed for you. Yes. Yes, it's a problem. It's a problem. Praying, praying is uh, in essence the same level or actually lesser level than learning Torah. Learning Torah is higher level of Kedusha than praying. So it has nothing to do with messing up with the words. You mess up with the words even without marijuana. It has nothing to do with messing up with the words. It has to, it has to do with Kvod Hashem, the honor of Hashem. If, let's say for example, Avdil, you were to meet the king of uh, some country or the richest man in the world and you were looking for a job. 
and uh, there's an opportunity. They advertise. Whoever gets this job is going to get a million dollars a month. And you see you have the qualifications to get it. You have the qualifications to get it, whatever it is. You need to, uh, I don't know, know the ABCs or something. Okay, you have the qualifications to get it. There's a line from here till uh, Jamaica. Long line. You're on the line. You wait, 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 you wait. You get bored a little bit, but you're still excited about the meeting. Eventually, you get to the guy. Eventually, you get to the boss, to the guy that's a billionaire. He's going to give a million dollars a month to whoever he employs. Now, let me ask you a question. You were bored. You were annoyed. You were angry. You were hot. You were cold. You were this. But did you ever think for a second, for a second, while you were on that line, trying to get a job for a million dollars a month, that... You should take the risk and maybe smoke a little marijuana right before the meeting. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Exactly, he's not going to hire you. He's not going to hire you. Exactly. Wow, genius. He's not going to hire you. Why is he not going to hire you? Why is he not going to hire you? Because you're a junkie. You cannot show up to a job interview, a junkie. What you do in your own business, that's your problem. Don't tell us about it. But you come into a job interview for a million dollars a month? Hi? Is something wrong with you? Now let me ask you a question. Who's bigger? The guy that is flesh and blood, but has a couple of dollars that Hashem gave him, or God that created him? Oh, So how can we say that it's not okay to arrive at a job interview? Hi. But maybe it's okay to arrive to Hashem while we study Torah or we pray to Him. Hi. Do you understand? So the reality is, Rabotai, is that we simply don't believe in God. That's the truth. We simply don't believe in God enough. Why? We believe there is a God. But we don't understand who God really is. We don't understand that God is here with us now. Now, right now, right the second he's here. After you leave, he's still with you, wherever you are. In the bathroom, out of the bathroom, in bed, out of bed, wherever you are, he's there always. If a person really understood what the psukim say, that, I, that David Amelak tells us, I always, I always can contemplate the fact that Hashem is next to me all the time. All the time. If we really understood it, we'd never make a single sin. Why? He's scared to death. He's watching. How can I go against him? He's watching me. Going against your parents is one thing. Going against your boss is one thing. Going against the customer is one thing. But you're still not going to do it in front of them. Everybody has a little sense of busha. It's a little bit of embarrassment. Even the little troublemaking kid, he's not going to be trouble right in front of his parents as long as he's normal. He's going to do it behind their back when they're out, when they're working. When they're, he's going to create trouble when they're not around. When they come back, he's a little tatale. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was studying all day, Abba. What's studying? How come the whole house is full of ketchup all over the walls? I don't know. Wow, it's a good question, Abba. What do you mean? You were the only one home. Uh, yeah, you're right. I was the only one home. I don't know how the ketchup got there. You're not going to do it in front of them. You're not going to do it. He, you know you did it. He knows you did it, but you're still going to deny it. Why? Because you have a sense of busha. You have a sense of embarrassment, a sense of fear. Now, if we really truly understood that Hashem Bach is right next to us right now, and at all times, we would never sin. Why? He's watching me. He's watching me use what he gave me against him. Do you understand the level, the level of craziness that is? So even, even more so, Abutai, when it comes to smoking and drinking and all of these different things that are not allowed according to the Torah, especially when it comes to doing it during prayer, before prayer, during studying Torah, and so on. So, in general, you're not allowed to alter your state of mind. But, but, there are things that the Chachamim used and were allowed to use. So, for example, in the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, it says that they used to have a certain, I guess you call it in English, insect, called devil. Devil is like what came to Egypt. What came to Egypt? There was uh, one of the plagues that came to Egypt. It's like a grasshopper or locust, locusts, but not quite locusts. 
the Yemenites till this day, the ones that are still in Yemen, know of which one it is. And there is a certain version of it that's actually kosher, that you're allowed to eat. You're allowed to eat it. You are not allowed to eat it because you don't know it and you don't have this minag. But the Yemenites that live in Yemen, that know which one exactly is the right one, they're allowed to eat it. It's kosher. For everyone else, it's not allowed. Also, there's some Moroccans that know about it. Some Moroccans that know about it and they're allowed to eat it. But everyone else that doesn't know about it is not allowed to eat it. Why? Because you're most likely going to eat a bug. And you eat a bug, it's like eating pig six times. So there's a very thin line between kosher to the worst thing in the world. So now, I always ask myself, why would anybody eat this thing? It's really disgusting. You think about it. It's, I mean, again, obviously, I guess if you grow up with it, then it's, uh, I don't know, you grow up in China, you think that a dog is delicious, then I guess maybe uh, dogs look delicious to you. To me, it looks hideous. You, if you're in China, they, they, uh, there's a saying. They eat anything that moves and anything with legs. And if it doesn't move, if it doesn't move, it doesn't have any legs, they put it on it. Anything in the ocean except ships they eat. Anything with legs except a chair. So you see in the markets in certain parts of Asia, they have mamash bugs and stuff like that and like boxes and people just, oh, it's good. They eat it. Like it's like, a, it's like unbelievable. To me, it's disgusting. But, and to most people, I think. But to them, it's not. They grow up that way. But again, as a Jew, as a Jew I'm thinking, listen, a fellow Jew is eating a grasshopper or a locust thing. It looks like it. It acts like it. It's the same thing. How could it be? And then I found out. What well, I found out? What's the secret? What's the secret? The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that I believe it was Rava. Rava one day took one of these and started eating it. Started eating it. And uh, one of the other Chachamim I think it was Rabbi Chia, maybe. Excuse me if I mistake the names. It doesn't really change the story. It says, don't eat it. Don't eat it. It's not kosher. Rabbi says, no, it's kosher. This is the one. He goes, no, not because of that. Not because of that. He says, it's disgusting. It's disgusting me. And if it's disgusting me, it makes it not kosher. Meaning if a food is disgusting, it actually makes it not kosher. So you could eat it, it's kosher technically, but you have to eat it alone. You can't eat it in front of people. But the way he was eating it, he was eating it like in the open. Like next, next to Rabbi Chia. Rabbi Chia is disgusting me, so it's not kosher, you don't have to eat it. So the Quran asks, why would he even eat it, Bechlal? Why would he eat it? He says, because if you eat this locust from the right side, from the right side, of whatever the right side of a locust is, it opens up your mind. And you could retain any amount of information you want. Your mind opens up, like to no limit. But unless, unless you eat the second side, the left side now, you're going to lose everything you learned. Everything you learned. So you have to eat the right side, learn as much as you want, and then you want to retain it, eat the left side. Shtabach shimo. Unbelievable. So I said, okay, that's, that makes sense. That makes sense why they would eat this hideous thing. There's also a, um, uh, a plant, a plant called Bilado. Bilado was a plant that uh, would dry the brain. A dry brain makes the uh, brain uh, retain information. Your brain naturally is, is wet. But if it gets drier, you're able to retain information and it increases your memory exponentially. The problem is with the Belladol is that it was very dangerous and, if you're, and it wouldn't, your brain wouldn't stop becoming dry and many people die from it. So, for example, the Chida. The Chida says, he writes in, a, uh, in, his, uh, in his book, Magal Tov, that uh, he, ate, he ate him and another Chacham, ate it when they were young, when they were kids. And he said, I, I bless Hashem for not killing me. But he lost, he lost the feeling to, uh, he lost his uh, feeling to one of his toes. 
He lost the feeling from one of his toes. But look at the gain that he had. His brain opened up, became one of the biggest giants in history. But the other Chacham, the other Chacham eventually got uh, sick and died. Like sick mentally and uh, committed suicide. Committed suicide. He was in uh, Yeshivat Porat Yosef, one of the giants over there. He knew all the books by heart. Something unbelievable. But eventually he uh, lost his mind and committed suicide. So uh, there are different things, different tools that we use to not alter our state of mind, to assist a person to study and, and to earn Torah. But marijuana is definitely not one of them. It's definitely not one of them. So now, Abutai, getting back to our topic at hand, is that all of this, all of this truth hasn't changed ever. This is not new. This is not a new version of the truth. The problem is, is that nothing is new. Even human behavior, human nature is not new. Sinners have always existed. People that go against Hashem have always existed. The prophet Isaiah says, he yelled, he rebukes certain women in those generation. Why are you walking around with high heels and bells on the heels? What do you want, the Romans to marry you? It's like, ah, oh, let the Romans marry us. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the wives of the rabbis of that generation, walking with high heels and, uh, and uh, wigs and, um, and bells on their heels. So people that went against Hashem have always existed. But people that do tshuva have always existed as well. What's the difference between the two? The difference between the two is one is looking to fulfill the truth, the other one is trying to ignore it. The other one is trying to run away from it. Now typically, a person that does tshuva is going to want other people to do tshuva along with him, along with her. You don't want to be alone. It's lonely at the top. And tshuva is difficult because in essence what you're doing is you're going against the tide. All of your friends are still mechaleh Shabbat, you're keeping Shabbat by yourself. It's tough. I remember when I first started keeping Shabbat, maybe 20 years ago, the first time I did tshuva, and uh, I was in college. I decided I'm going to keep Shabbat. And... Uh, um, I was, uh, you know, I decided, okay, I can't go to the parties. I was in college, so I would sit home. I was sitting in my room. All the friends would come over. Hey, okay, see you later. And I'm just sitting there in my, in my room by myself the whole night, bored to death. You know, I, I didn't learn Torah. I didn't, know, I didn't know what to do. There was no books. There was no nothing. You're just sitting there looking at the wall the whole night, regretting the whole thing. That's why it didn't last. The only way you could continuously grow with your tshuva is by learning. Without learning, your tshuva is not going to last. But that's why I always try to get other people to stay with me and so on. But for the most part, people will hang out for maybe an hour or two and then leave and go out and do what they got to do. So the thing is, though, is that when a person does tshuva, he wants other people to, to get people to come along. The problem is, is that if he doesn't do full tshuva to the point where he's already started or she's already started working on herself to the extent of not just keeping the mitzvot, but also fixing yourself. Keeping the mitzvot, keeping Shabbat, keeping Talat Mishpacha, keeping kosher. Those are all good things to do and that you have to do anyway. But real tshuva, real tshuva begins with your midot. Begins with your character traits. That's real tshuva. You have to fix yourself. You have to use those mitzvot that Hashem gave us. You have to use that Torah that Hashem gave us and apply it to yourself in order to fix yourself. So that means that if you haven't, you're still angry. You're still frustrated. You're still all of the bad things. And especially when it comes to Nubal Tshuva, the Gemara says, if you see a Talmit Chacham, a young Talmit Chacham, meaning a young scout, someone is just learning to us, starting out, get angry, don't lose any, uh, you know, any respect for him. Why? Because he's new, he's new, he's like a new Baal Tshuva, and he doesn't know how to control the fire from Torah. Torah is fire. So now he has, he already had his character trait of how he was, and now he's adding fire to it. So if he already had fire, he has now even more fire. He can potentially get even angrier. 
He could be even angrier than what he was before. He says, don't, uh, don't be uh, upset. Don't be upset at him so much. Why? Give him some leeway. Why? Because right now he's adding fire and he doesn't know what to do with it yet. He hasn't learned about that yet. He doesn't know how to control that fire yet. He doesn't know how to control that fire and he's turning it into a bad thing like anger. And this is something that you see with a lot of Baalei Tshuva is that they try to get their family aboard. Uh, they try to get their friends on board. They try to get people on board. And uh, as soon as somebody says, no, no, I don't want to do it, or they say it a different opinion, they lose their mind. The Baal Tshuva I'm talking about. The Baal Tshuva loses their mind. They start yelling at people, cursing them sometimes. They become worse than the Chiloni. And the guy looks at them, and he's like, oh, if this is what uh, you want me to do, you want me to be religious like you, curse and scream and yell and get angry? Psh, I don't even want to be religious. And it turns into a chilul Hashem. So this is why it's extremely important to know that kaas, anger, is not something that you just work on one time, you learn one shiur, two shiur, three shiur, four shiurs, you're finished. Anger is something that you have to work on for the rest of your life, just like any other midah. So, the uh, Mishnah here says that there's... Uh, Four different types of temperament. One who is angered easily and pacified easily. His gain is offset by his loss. This is a person that every little thing makes him angry. But he's also mild to some extent that uh, he cools off pretty quickly too. Says the gain that he has that uh, he cools off quickly is a good thing. But... It's not really that. Uh, it's not really that great, because he gets he's gonna get angry in five minutes anyway. So whatever gain he has from not being uh, from not holding on to this anger, he loses it because he's gonna get angry quickly anyway. The second guy is someone that's hard to anger but hard to pacify. This there's two opinions on it. One of them says this is a good thing because uh, if it's hard to get this ang- this guy angry, and it's also hard. To pacify him, this is a good thing. Why? Because if it's hard to get him angry, that means that we can work on to do whatever we can to cater the world around him to him to make sure we never get him angry. If it's already hard to get him angry, then it's easy not to make him angry. Because once he gets angry, Yishemechem. But that's where the second opinion comes from Meiri. Meiri says this actually makes him more dangerous. Why is it more dangerous? Because this is the type of guy that he's not going to get angry right away. But when he gets angry, he's a suicide uh, bomber. When he gets angry, it's Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's World War 17. It's dangerous. He hasn't got angry in 20 years, but now he finally got angry. Ooh, what? Everybody in the neighborhood is going to find out he got angry. So these people are dangerous. These people shoot up schools. So now the next one is, This one is a person that's hard to anger good and also pacifies easily not only is it hard to get this guy angry but also if he ever does get angry he forgives right away this guy is a chassid this guy is the real chassid this guy is the real tzaddik this guy is the best why is he the best because of course everyone's going to get angry at some point even Moshe Rabbeinu David Melech. people got angry anger is part of life but don't make excuses for yourself. Just because anger is part of life doesn't mean that you're supposed to get angry. Anger is part of life means you have to learn how to control it. Moshe Rabbeinu got angry and he paid for it. Moshe Rabbeinu paid for it. During the times that anyone got angry in the Torah, they paid for it. Even, even when uh, Sarai Menu got upset. She got upset at Avraham. He said, Hashem's going to be a judge between you and me. The guy turned out upset because she couldn't have a kid. He said, oh, Hashem's going to be a judge between you and me. Hashem says, oh, Hashem, I'm going to be a judge? Okay, I'll judge you first. That's what she did before him. Same thing with, uh, with Yaakov. When Rachel cried to him, Rachel cried to Yaakov, no, uh, I can't have kids, I might as well be dead. He tells her, oh, what am I, God? Hashem says, ah, that's how you answer her? She's crying to you. That's how you answer her. You get upset? You get upset with her? That's how you answer her? By my name, meaning Hashem swears in His name. He says, 
you'll see that your sons elsewhere will all bow to her son. All the tribes bow to Yosef HaTzadik. Meaning, there's a, there's, a, there's a measure for measure here. The fact that anger exists is no one's denying it. It doesn't allow you a free ticket to just do whatever you want. You have to control it. That's what distinguishes you from being an animal. That's the point of the whole Torah. If you're not going to control your desires, you're not going to control your bad character traits, you're not going to control your behavior, why live? That's exactly what the Gaomi Vina said. If a person came to this world and did not fix his bad midot, for what did he live? What, what was his purpose? Why did, he even, why did he even come to the world? Yeah, but he made money. So, he died. The money's still here. Yeah, but he got married. So, she could have married somebody else. But he's the only guy in the world. Oh, he had kids. Eh, somebody, big deal. We have 8 billion people. The extra 2 kids that he brought, or 5 kids, or 10. Eh. If he didn't fix himself, what, what was his purpose? He himself, his kids, okay, Hashem, his wife, everybody else has a purpose. Him, himself, what was his purpose? If he didn't fix himself. So, here we see that a person is expected to have anger. It's not a, it's not a secret. But he's also expected to attain the midah of chasidut. He's attaining the, the character trait of becoming pious. How? By working on himself to the extent where he doesn't get angry often, and even if he ever does, he lets it go quickly. That's the ideal situation. We're going to go into more details of all this momentarily, especially this last part. Last part is that a person that noach lichos v'kashel irtzot rasha. A person who's angered easily and is pacified, is hard to pacify to. This guy is the worst person on earth. This guy is unfortunately the typical hothead. What's a typical hothead? He's not only gets angry every two seconds, but once he gets angry, he doesn't let it go. Somebody cut him off, he's angry for three hours. Yeah, but what happened three hours ago? Let it go. Nah, you don't know me. I don't understand what I would do. You don't know who I am. Who are you? You're Joe. You're Steve. Who are you? Nah, you don't know me. Huh? He? Huh? Crazy. Like over, overdoing it. Overdoing it. This person is dangerous. According to Rashi, a person who's always angry little gremlin walking around, he's always upset at the world, is considered a rasha. Why? Because his temper will eventually cause him to transgress the word of Hashem. The Gemara in Maseret Brachot, page 29b says, don't become angry and do not sin. Meaning, if you're angry, you're guaranteed to sin. The Tiferet Yisrael says that a person who's quick to anger... It's clearly not in control of himself. And someone who's slow to be pacified suffers from, from, a, from a midah that paralyzes him. If he's not able to let go of the anger, it paralyzes him. He's not able to function like a normal person. The combination of these two characters that Tiferet Israel says is literally such a huge flaw that it opens the doorway to sin against God and against one's fellow man. Meaning, is nothing. there's no one that he's not going to go against. His mom, his dad, his brother, his sister, his teacher, his son, his wife, everybody. This guy is literally a terrorist. Yeah, but he's such a nice guy when he's not angry. When? When is he, when, when is he, when is he not angry? Oh, you know, sometimes. And according to the Rambam, Maimonides and the Maharal to someone with the combination of these two f- character flaws is considered outright evil. An evil person. The Gemara in Maseret Nedarim, page 22b, uses Proverbs 29 22 as a source to say that an angry person incites strife 
and one possessed by rage brings much sin. The, a habitual uh, uh, anger is an indication that one has transgressed many sins. Meaning that this person, this person is angry. If you can tell them the next time they walk in and walk out to stop, they'll I'd appreciate it. Uh, it's getting to the point where it's disturbing. It's seven times already. Um, a person that's angry, there's a reason for it. What's the reason the Gemara says? It sins. Because every time he's angry, he creates more sins. And every time he creates more sins, he creates more demons. He gives more power to the Sitra Acha. And the Sitra Acha, what does the Sitra Acha do? The sitra Acha tells him, oh, make more sins. Get angry again. And it's a continuous cycle that never ends. It's a continuous cycle that never ends. So a person needs to understand that if a person is angry constantly, that means that he's made a lot of, a lot of sins. You okay? Huh? Okay, you guys have to stop coming in and out. It's very distracting, okay? A person that sins a lot also is going to be very angry. A person that's very angry is also going to sin a lot. So it's important to know that one thing leads to the other. Now, so how do you deal with the world? Somebody asked a wonderful question after the two shurim that we had last week. How do you deal with the world then? There's no mitzvah to be a fool. And let people uh, walk on you. At the same token, some people you work with them, if you don't get angry, you're like Moshe Rabbeinu. Because it's so difficult to work with. It's so difficult to talk to. It's so difficult to deal with. Because some people, they are convinced they're the only thing that matters in the world. You know, it's like the world revolves around them. And they feel like they could just do and function according to whatever fits them, whatever suits them, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And such people, it's very difficult not to get angry. It's very difficult not to be angry around them. Why? Because this is a person where, for example, he goes into a parking slot, and there's only one slot, and he sees another person, I clearly is going into the spot, but he cuts them off. He's like, oh, I'm here. I'm here. I got here before you. Yeah, but you knew the other guy's there. Yeah, but I got here for you. I got here before you. Or a line. He cuts off the line. Yeah, but you're cutting off. There's 100 people on the line. How come you're cutting them? Ah, listen, I'm in a hurry. So is everybody else. Or different behavior that's careless, where he really, not to be angry at such a person, but it's, 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 it would be a miracle, especially if you're around them on a regular basis. Sometimes you have colleagues at work, in business, and some of these people are just uh, really obnoxious people. They take other people's lunch, you know, you have a fridge, a common fridge or something like that. They take people's lunch or they're very dirty. You know, they, they eat like stuff and they leave stuff everywhere. You know, if there's like a common room that everybody eats at, they eat, but they expect other people to clean after them. Or if there's an event everybody goes to, they always, you know, they eat, you know, like they never ate before, but they never have any money. You ever have those people? They always want to go out, but they never have any money. So why are you going out if you don't have any money? The last one, I have a lot of experience with. I don't know, maybe apparently all the people that never had any money know me. All of them wanted to become my friends. And I'm not talking about just when I had money. Even when I didn't have money, I was young. For some reason, all of these people, they always wanted to go out, they always wanted to go eat, go this, go this, go that. As soon as the bill came, oh yeah, I forgot my money. All of you ten people forgot your money? What, you got to have a gathering and everybody put their wallet in a box? And you guys all forgot it in the same box? How does nobody have any money? Oh, they want, so it's just, they, there's certain people that are just, they literally believe that the world revolves around them. And the world is supposed to cater to them. And it's very difficult not to be angry. They borrow things without telling you. They borrow things and don't return them. They borrow things and destroy them. You say to yourself, it's better you didn't return it. It's people that are just careless. There's a lot of them. All of these things, this, this, is, this happens in the world. I'm not the only one who knows these people. So one time, there was three guys. 
three guys on a, a boat. The boat collapsed. And the three survived and went on an island. All three on an island. So they're on an the island, they're surviving two, one, two, 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 after a month, two months, three months, six months, eight months, a year. No, uh, no rescue, no nothing. So they've already become acclimated to the land, and they're, 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 they're there, they're doing their thing. Every day one of them goes fishing, every day one of them goes, uh, you know, prepares the food, every day something happens, they try to keep themselves busy. One day one of the guys goes fishing, and he sees some, uh, something shiny in the bottom of the water, he goes, jumps after it, and he takes something, he sees a little demon out of a genie in a, in a, uh, in a bottle. Genie comes out. Yes. First guy says, he said, okay, you have, you have a wish. Each one of you guys has a wish. First guy that jumped to get the genie says, get me out of here. Poop, he disappeared. Second guy, okay, you're the one that cooks. What do you want? He goes, ah, get me out of here. Poop, disappeared. Okay, third guy, you're the one that's uh, supposed to prepare everything. What, what do you want? He goes, listen, looks like it's going to be boring without them. Can you bring them back? <laughs> Some people are so selfish that they don't see, they don't see the world around them as being something that's, that's separate from them. They see that everything is a part of them. They're like a little, literally like a mini, mini god. They've turned themselves into a mini god. They think everything, everybody needs to cater to them. And that's also when a person is like that, it's very easy for him to go against Hashem. And the reason why is because if he thinks that the world revolves around him, then if the world doesn't cater to him, you should try to read the book after this year. It's not good etiquette to read a book in front of somebody that's giving a lecture. Um, the uh, you guys are very good today. You guys are awesome today. You guys, uh, you guys are wh- wh- helping me work on my midav anger today. <laughs> Seven people come in. Eight people come out. Nine, 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 Nineteen people come in, come out, sit down, get up. They do. I was expecting one of them to do a thumb, somersault over here. <laughs> and the other guy started to maybe sing YMCA. Nobody sees. Everybody just sees me. The camera. Everybody just sees me. They don't know what I'm looking at the whole time. They don't understand that the biggest chuba of the shoe is just what I'm dealing with, what I'm seeing. God bless you guys. Today you guys are sharp. Today you guys, you guys are, you guys, you guys did. Okay, I'm doing shoe number three of the series. You guys are doing four already. You're already doing four. And next week, I'm going to bring a camera that's going to watch you. Instead of watch me, it's going to watch you guys. So, you know the best crowd? You, on, on Facebook, they're good. They, they, they listen. So, good job, Facebook. You guys are good listeners. So, so now, when a, person, when a person really believes or lives a life where he subconsciously, you know, believes that the world is supposed to revolve around him. The world is supposed to cater to him. It's very easy for this person to complain. A person that becomes a complainer, who does he complain to? He complains about everybody around him. And eventually he's going to complain to Hashem. Now, we're supposed to cry to Hashem when we have problems. We're supposed to cry to Hashem when we need something. No problem. Complaining to Hashem, on the other hand, is a problem. Where do we learn it from? We actually learn it from this week's parasha. We see that in the last couple of weeks, we have this whole shiur. One, two, three, and four of the anger is all in the last two weeks' parasha. So here in last week's parasha, last week's parasha, Naso, we see that the wayward woman, the Sota, is not someone that's 100% guilty. Not 100% guilty. 
Meaning, this woman is married, and the Torah says that her husband is jealous, and he tells her, do not be alone in a room with this specific person, with anyone really. But you're not allowed, a, a Jewish woman is not allowed to be alone in a room with any other man that's not a husband, unless that room is something that anyone can enter at any moment. If, let's say, it's a, it's a meeting, you can meet with another person. There's no problem. As long as anyone can enter the meeting. It's not a locked room. If it's locked and no one can enter it, you, my friend, are sinning against the Torah. So now the husband is jealous. He says, don't go in a room with this specific person, this friend of yours. Whoever this person is, don't go. And she's caught doing it anyway. The husband gets angry, and he brings her to the, uh, the, the coin. He brings her to the coin gadol. And this is, uh, it comes out of jealousness. This whole thing comes, this whole anger stems from jealousness, the Torah says, in Parashat Naso. And now he brings her in front of the Kohen, and he says, listen, I think she cheated. I think she was, uh, I, there's witnesses that she was in a room alone with a specific person, and I think she cheated. And now, there are no cameras in those days. There's something better. There's Hashem. So now, they don't want to kill her. Because if she cheated on her husband and then she denies it and they catch her, they have to kill her. They don't want to kill her. So what do they try to do? They try to intimidate her to the point where she admits that she cheated on her husband. So they try to tie her out by making her walk around the Beit HaMikdash. They rip her clothes. They uh, take off her kisui rosh. They yell at her and so on and so forth. Admit, admit, admit you did it. Because at least if you admit, we don't have to kill you. You get a divorce, but we don't have to kill you. last thing we want to do in Judaism is kill people. Even though we talk about death every week, that's not the goal. The goal is to tell you that it's death so you don't sin. Not so you sin and we kill you. That's not the point of the Torah. Torah is so you live by it. But we have to tell you, if you go against it, you're going to die. That's the whole point. That's what Hashem was telling Am Yisrael at Mount Sinai. All of you heard my commandments and all of you died hearing them. Why? I want to scare you so you don't sin. So you know there's real consequences here. So now this woman went into a room, locked, and did against what, uh, what the Torah says, what her husband says. And now the Kohen Gadol has to give her this water if she really denies it. And she sinned really. And she drinks the water, she will blow up and die. If she didn't sin, then there's actually going to be Shlom Bayit out of this. Why? The Kohen will give them blessing. If they never had kids before, they're going to have kids now. If the kids they had were ugly, they'll turn good looking. If, uh, and so on. Different things. Different blessings. But we see that this is one form of anger. What is this anger? This anger is not good anger. It's jealousy. Now obviously, he has a real, he's, he's right for being jealous. And his wife is torturing him for some reason doing this anyway, even though he told her not to do it, she's doing it anyway. But we see that this is one form of anger, and when the man actually exercises on this anger, he tells her, don't do it, and she still does it, and he has witnesses follow her to, to see that she's doing it, we see, okay, there's a, there's a way to deal with all of this. The Torah has a way of dealing with all of it, but it's not an ideal. It's not ideal. Why? Because now you're putting a person's life uh, you know, at, at risk, not even just their physical life, because technically, even if she didn't sin, she still has to go through the entire embarrassment of proving she didn't sin. She has to be tired out, everybody's watching her, this whole process is, watched, is viewed by people, there's thousands and thousands of people watching her go through this whole thing. They rip her clothes, our kisui rosh, it's a big embarrassment. So if she didn't sin, the reason why she gets such a big blessing is because she didn't sin and she went to as, as a uh, consolation. But it's not full consolation. Why? Because she still did something wrong. She still shouldn't have been with that guy in the room. She still technically sinned, but not to the full extent. But this we see is one form of anger. And a guy wants to rebuke her, and Torah says, "Okay, this is uh, we have uh, we have this, but it's not ideal. It's not ideal. It's not an ideal situation." Another op- another issue that we have, another issue that we have is we see in this week's parasha, 
You see, in this week's parasha, Am Yisrael complains in chapter 11 in uh, Parashat Baalotecha, the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 1. Excuse me, I'm a little cold. It says, Vayi am kemit onenim ra beozne Adonai, vayishma Adonai, vayichara po, vativar bam esh Adonai, vatochal bekziya machane. It says, the people took to seeking complaints, meaning what? They started complaining against God. Started complaining against God, and it was evil in the ears of Hashem. And Hashem heard, and His wrath flared, and the fire of Hashem burned against them, and consumed, it consumed them at the edge of the camp, meaning all of the people that were at the edge, Hashem killed all of them. Where's the edge? What, so unlucky people, they ended up hanging out at the edge? So what, all the, all the, all the annoying ones that were in the middle complaining nonstop, everything was okay with them, just because they were located on... Uh, on Broadway, but not on uh, on uh, Water Street. Why? Just because the location Hashem didn't kill them? No. What it means here, Rabotai, you should know, is that the edge meaning, where what was the edge? The edge was a place where all the leaders took place. All the leaders, all the rabbis. All the rabbis were at the edge. That's where all their camps were. And Hashem killed all of them. Why did He kill all of them? He said... Your people complained against me and you didn't even rebuke them. If you didn't rebuke your people, then there's no point for you. There's no point for you. There's no point for the Torah that you know. There's no point for anything that you say. There's no point for your speech. There's no point for your synagogue. There's no point for your institution, organization, causes. There's no point. If you're not going to tell the people not to complain against Hashem, if you're not going to tell people to do tshuva, if you're not going to tell people to actually fix themselves, there's no point of you. So what did Hashem do in those days? He killed them. Meaning we see here <coughs> that they got angry. They got angry and they complained against Hashem. What did they get angry about? They got angry at the rules. They got angry at the Torah. They didn't want to keep Talat Mishpacha. They didn't want to keep family purity. They didn't like the food. They didn't like the situation. They didn't like the difficulty. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. They complained against Hashem. They didn't want to do tshuva. Hashem said, well, that's why I brought rabbis to teach you. If these rabbis are not going to teach you, I don't need the rabbis. I have to, I have to replace them. So here we see another form of anger. Hashem doesn't like complainers. He doesn't like complainers one bit. Then after that, we see another. We see another. We see that in chapter 11, moving on, verse 24 to 29. Moshe left and spoke the words of Hashem to the people, and he gathered 70 men from among the elders of the people and had them stand around a tent. Hashem descended in a cloud and spoke to him and he increased some of the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the 70 men. These are the men that replaced these other rabbis. Moving on, the two men remained behind the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the second was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Meaning they had Ruch HaKodesh. They had been among the recorded ones. But they had not gone out of the tent and they prophesied in the camp. They were prophets. The youth ran and told Moshe and he said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Yeshua ben Nun, the servant of Moshe, since his youth, spoke up and said, My Lord Moshe, incarcerate them. Moshe said to Yeshua, Are you being zealous for my sake? Meaning, here we see that Yeshua ben Nun saw that there was a couple of people that were given were given prophecy and he was upset. Why? He was upset because he said maybe Moshe is going to die, maybe something's going to happen to my leader, they're doing something that's against the rules and so on. 
and he got upset. And Moshe comes to Yeshua ben Nun and says, Oh, don't uh, be angry on my account. I mean, I understand you're trying to protect my, you're trying to protect my image, you're trying to protect my kavod, you're trying to do everything, but don't let it get to this point. Don't be zealous for my sake. So here we see that even being zealous for the sake of something good has to be done in a certain way. So, in the beginning of the parasha, God bless you, in the beginning of the parasha, we have an unusual mitzvah that connects all of this. In the beginning of Parashat Ba'alotecha, Hashem Itbarach gives the mitzvah of, uh, to, to Aaron HaKohen. He says, in, chap, in uh, chapter uh, 8, verse 4, V'ze ma'ase ha'menorah mikshah za'av ad yerecha ad pircha mikshah hi kamar'e asher e'e Adonai et Moshe ken asa et ha'menorah. So, in verse 4, it says this is the workmanship of the menorah hammered out of gold from its base to its flower it's hammered out according to the vision that Hashem showed Moshe so did he make the menorah so here we learn that uh, this menorah this this I don't know how you say menorah in English no it's not candlestick it's a huge 3,000 ounces of gold it's not candlesticks Anyway, it's the big menorah. Everybody knows what the menorah is. It's one huge thing at the end of the Mikdash. Uh, I guess menorah. Anyway, it's the big thing that is, uh, they lit in the Beta Mikdash, the Mishkan. Now, this was made in a miraculous way. The whole thing was made out of one piece of gold, one nugget. It wasn't pieces put together. Where the Torah says that when Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, no, make the menorah, Moshe says, I can't. I can't make the menorah. He says, okay, okay, no, you can, you can. He goes, I can't, I can't do anything. Why I can't? I'm making little pieces, maybe, but putting the whole thing, you know, manipulating the metal, manipulating the, the gold to such a huge amount, almost 3,000 ounces, uh, to, to be one piece, one piece. I can't. So it said, that he's like, all right, try, try, just put the gold, just try, do something. He put the gold in the fire, Hashem made the rest. But he gave him the mitzvah as if he made it. But the point we learned from this menorah, that Hashem likes completion. Hashem likes for us to be complete. He says, I want you to have the menorah in one piece. Why one piece? Because I want the menorah to be like an analogy of what I expect from you. I want you to be complete. I want your mitzvot to be complete. I want your midot to be complete. I want your learning to be complete. I want your relationship to be complete. To be mushlam. Mushlam is complete. What does it mean complete? If you're going to pray, if you're going to go to Beknesset and pray, pray, don't socialize. If you're going to study, study. Don't socialize and do other things. Don't play with your phone and then read a line and play with your phone and read a line and play with your phone and read a line. Uh, um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that a person that studies Torah that way, that he stops randomly while he's studying Torah without an intention to stop, he just stops randomly, they're going to feed him Gechalere Tamim. What's Gechalere Tamim? It's hot coals that never go out of fire. That's what we're going to feed him in Olam Abba. It's Genom. Another word. It's not a good place. Don't go. Meaning you can't study Torah that way. If you're gonna to study Torah, study Torah. Stop playing with your phone. If you're gonna to go to Shu, sit down. Stop going to the bathroom. Stop going outside. Stop going inside. Stop going. Move. Stay. Sit. Sit. Stay. It's two hours. God bless you. Sit. For heaven's sake. Stop talking to each other. Complete. You're all gonna do a mitzvah. Do it. You understand what I mean? Do it. You're going to give tzedakah? Give it with a smile. Don't be one of these people that give tzedakah, but it's like, I can't 
can't believe I gotta give this myself. It's okay, it's okay, I can't believe it. You guys like suffering, giving tzedakah. It's like suffering, it's skin. Suffering. Some people love money so much they can't get they can't get rid of it. He can't get rid of it. He doesn't want to buy a sandwich even. It's like, yeah, it's how hard I work for this money. Yeah, but you need to eat, buddy. You need to eat. He goes out on dinner. He makes his own wife pay for the bill. No, buy it from your account. What do you mean your account? I'm your wife. Yeah, no, buy it from your, your account. Your account. By the way, a Jewish marriage, a kosher Jewish marriage, there is no your account. There's only one account if it's a Jewish marriage. If you're a goy, do what you want. If you're a righteous goy, then you live the same way as, as, as uh, you were supposed to, which is one account. You want a happy marriage, there's one account. You want a temporary marriage, have multiple accounts. Anyway, Rabotai, Hashem wants us to be like the menorah. He says you're going to do tshuva. I want your tshuva to be complete. Don't just start keeping Shabbat and become one of these robots that keep Shabbat and thinks there is a tzaddik, but still hasn't fixed one midah in 70 years. Don't just be one of these people that learns the same book for 30 years. You haven't advanced to another book. 30 years, he's still the same book. What are you reading? Ah, oh, Mesilat Yesharim. You're reading Mesilat Yesharim 20 years already. Yeah, it's a really good book. Listen, if you were really reading Mesilat Yesharim for that many years, you would have read the entire Torah too. If you would have learned anything from Mesut in the first chapter, you would have read the entire Torah already. He wants you to be complete. Your learning needs to be complete. Your marriage needs to be complete. Your midot needs to be... Everything needs to be complete. And that's Rabotai, the answer to all of these issues. Yes, of course, there's different things you can get angry. You can get angry at your wife. You can get angry at your husband. You can get angry for the right cause because you don't have food, let's say. You can get angry for the sake of Hashem because you think you're a tzaddik and so on. But Hashem says, if you're complete, you're going to know how to control it. So now, sometimes when people, when Baalei Tshuva especially, have this issue where they want everybody to do tshuva also with them. And as soon as they see that other people are not listening to them, they're not listening to them, they get upset. And they start losing their mind. They start getting angry. They start cursing. They start yelling. They start doing things that are not according to the Torah. Meaning, they start using their own personal opinion. Now, Rabotai, we have a problem. Why? Because zealous, the zealous state of mind, zealousness, without the instructions of the Torah, is 100% arrogance. It has nothing to do with Torah. So don't tell me you're zealous for the sake of Torah if you're yelling at people for no reason. Even if you have a reason. If your yelling is, doesn't have a Torah source for it, you're not allowed to do it. So... Anyone that is trying to help people do tshuva, if you're getting angry, stop. You're not helping. You have to do tshuva. You have to do tshuva. You have to stop being angry. If you're getting angry helping people, don't help yourself first. You have to help yourself. Because once you're angry, no one's going to listen to you. And to understand what it means, what anger could actually lead a person to do, one of the, um, one of the big Mezakeh Rabim in Israel, um, Rav Gosman, I believe, he, uh, he visited him. I think it's him. I may be wrong with the name again. I'm not very good at names. But I believe it's him. He went to visit somebody in jail. When he would go to jail and visit people, and one time he uh, visited a specific person and he sees the guy calm, collected, religious, learns Torah in his cell. Really nice, mamash, amazing guy. You look at the guy, he's like, he doesn't belong here. He doesn't belong here. He's a like, religious, nice guy, good midot, happy. Dee, dee. Wow. He looks at his rap sheet. The guy committed murder of his best friend on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur. 
You look at the guy, you look at the rap sheet, they don't match. They don't match. It's like the guy is a little mini Moshe Rabbeinu, and here you have uh, Hitler. How could it be? So he goes to visit him, he sits next to him, and he tries to get to know the person, maybe the person's crazy, maybe this, maybe that. After a while, the cellmate says, you're probably asking yourself, how could it be that I killed somebody on Yom Kippur? He says, no, yeah, no, you could tell, you could say it, yeah. He says, I've been religious for a while. And uh, during that time on Yom Kippur one day, we went to, to, to synagogue, we prayed. And then there was a break for a couple of hours between the prayers. It's a long day, but you have a break usually for like an hour and a half, two hours in the afternoon. So my friend and I went to my house. And we just, you know, we said if we're going to go to sleep, probably going to miss prayer, so let's just talk. We started talking, debated about some nonsense issue. Started disagreeing. One thing led to another. He started really getting me angry. I went into my room, I took the gun, and I shot him. This is my best friend, Kolarav. I haven't stopped regretting that day. But at the moment of anger, when the Torah says, the Ramban writes, Nigeret Ramban, that when a person gets angry, all of Gehenom, take control over him, he says, I saw it. When I, I let myself get so angry, mamash, I lost self-control, I went, I took the gun, I killed my friend. And I've been trying to do tshuva for it ever since. Meaning that when a person gets angry, the Torah, the Gemara specifically says, Kol mide Gehenom sholtin bo. All types of Gehenom take control over him. Why? Because all of these sins that he's made throughout the years, they all gather on top of him and they push him to go, go a step further, go a step further, say another word, say another curse, make another thing, push, yeah, ha, huh, ha. Huh. He loses his mind. He loses his mind. Depends for the reason. Depends for a reason. There's a time and a place to have it. There's a time and every person is going to have anger. There's no such thing as a person with no anger. Even Moshe Rabbeinu had anger. But a righteous person, a righteous person is going to know how to use that anger for the sake of Hashem. So for example, when he sees a person that's a Mechalet Shabbat, he's going to get angry to the point of using that anger to tell that person something. Not get angry and go beat up the guy or throw a rock at him. But meaning get angry at the situation and no one has done anything about it until now and go do it and, and, and become the person. Okay. Become zealous for the sake of Hashem at the right time, at a right time, not just any time. But again, anger itself is one of the things that a person needs to control more than anything else. Because if... He lets the anger get out of control. It's a hundred percent sin. So anger you're going to have. Now, the question is how to control it. How do you control this anger that you're going to get anyway? How do you use it for the right thing? You need that. That fire is necessary. If you see somebody teaching Torah that's against Hashem, if it doesn't get you angry, then you're most likely dead. You should check your 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 pulse. You should check your pulse. If you see that someone is teaching Christianity. If you see someone is teaching things that are against the Torah, if you see somebody that's committing open sins against the Torah, like being a, uh, in a, one of these gay parades or, 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 or anything like that, and that stuff doesn't get, get you angry, you have to check your pulse if you're still alive. If you're still alive. So of course you're going to get angry on it. But it doesn't mean that you're going to go out there and start shooting people. It doesn't mean you're going to start yelling and screaming. So there's a few things that a person needs to know. Getting angry at the situation is allowed as long as you're going to do something good about it. What's good? You Now you saw a bunch of people making a gay parade. What are you going to do? You're going to actually have a shiur to teach people why the Torah says it's not allowed to have a gay parade. Meaning that anger is to create enough fire in you, enough zealousness in you, 
that you're going to do something about it that's positive in the name of Hashem. If you see somebody teaching Christianity, let's say, or some other form of Avodah Zarah, you're going to go and become an anti-missionary. And you're going to fight the, the, the Shekel by exposing them, by showing these people are teaching lies, that it's against the Torah and so on and so forth. Meaning, you're going to use that fire that you get from anger for a positive purpose. But, if that fire gets out of control, then we have a problem. So now, how do you know that fire is out of control? If, if your behavior after you got angry has led you to curse, if your behavior has led you to curse, using some type of derogatory language that's curse word, your anger is now officially out of control. Out of control. Why? The Chachamim teaches in the Gemara that if a person was decreed in Shemaim for 70 years of good, meaning a whole life of good, a single curse, a single curse could cancel it all out. A single curse. Curse. Doesn't say English or French or Aramaic or Hebrew, any curse word. Why are they not curse words? I don't understand. It's a curse. Dirty word is a curse. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. Four letter word is a curse. It's a curse. It's disgusting. If you understand, the more you understand what it means, the more you understand how much you're disrespecting the creation and the creator. It's the, the mouth of a Jew should never have like a single curse come out of his mouth. And trust me, this is more difficult for me than for most people because most of my life I thought exactly what you're saying, which is that it's describing, it's the way I talk, it's the way this, it's normal, everybody says it, it's just this, it's just that. Nonsense. Nonsense. Civilized people do not curse. You do, not, you do not see successful people in life curse. Unless they're obnoxious and disgusting human beings. Which in that case, we're not measuring ourselves to them. We're measuring ourselves against the Torah Hashem. So a Jewish person should never curse. No one should ever curse. But the point is, if your anger has led you to say the four-letter word, or one of these disgusting words, then you know already officially your anger is now out of control. If your anger has led you to become violent, either with another person or against yourself or against an object. You take a, a piece of something, you throw it. You take a rock, you take a piece of plastic, a pen, a wall, you punch something. You've become violent. Your anger is out of control. Your anger is out of control. You have a problem. If your anger has gotten to the point where you decide that the only way for you to get relief is by publicly embarrassing the other party. Your anger is not only out of control, so is your Olam Abba. Because the Torah says, A person that publicly embarrasses another one has no share of the world to come. So, here we see that anger can easily be something that a person loses their olam aban. It's not, it's, not, it's, it's not not a big deal. It's a big deal. And each one of the examples that I gave you are everyday habits that people have. Embarrassing people in public, cursing, yelling, throwing stuff. These are things that people do every day. I know I did. So now how do you stop yourself? That's the question. What's your question? What about the opinion of the Gemara that the Rebbe Gilad said that when it's between two Yoshim Kol and Shesha, it's a, you're allowed to tell to an idol what to say, to shake his idol, and so they say it in Shemit. Yeah. That's essentially using... Like, you're allowed to take an idol and break it over him? Yeah, put it off his... Oh, put it off his butt? Okay, Okay, but that's, again, it's a, di it's a different situation. Today we're not allowed to do such things because they'll kill us. We're not the majority. But yeah, but the, there, is a, there is a gemara, uh, there is a teaching that the desecration of an idol is a mitzvah. 
The desecration of an idol is a mitzvah to such an extent that the first person that's mentioned in the Torah that was called a Jew, a Yehudi, was Mordechai. Why was Mordechai called a Yehudi? Because the Gemara Masechet Megillah says is because he actively went against Avodah Zarah. And anyone that actively goes against Avodah Zarah is called a real Jew. So there's a special condition here when it comes to desecrating and making fun, mocking all types of Avodah Zarah. This is something that's for, it's Kiddush Hashem. It's a mitzvah. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody taking, uh, seeing a, uh, a Jew uh, doing something he doesn't like or saying something he doesn't like and instead of, uh, instead of telling him to stop or talking to him in a civilized way, he decides to take the, something that, the first thing that he can grab and smash it on his head. Or he decides to curse him out. Or he decides to publicly embarrass him. Like for example, there's one person that says he used to watch my shurim. And I don't think he's watching my shurim right now because he wouldn't be doing this if he was. Even the walls are doing tshuva, Baruch Hashem. So I don't think he can watch the shurim on a weekly basis and not do tshuva. But apparently he decided that he disagreed with, his, with some local rabbi that he was attending a shul. He disagreed with him on something. Not that the rabbi uh, was teaching things against the Torah, but because the rabbi was uh, not saying enough about the people that weren't observing all of the mitzvot. He wasn't saying enough. So he decided to publicly embarrass the rabbi in front of everyone. And he thinks this is a mitzvah. He thinks that he's right. He wants to, you know, wants, he, thinks he's, he thinks he wants my support. I want him to watch my shiurim. So when a person is exercising his zealousness with a sin such as He's cursing people out. He's mocking them in public, you know, in, 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 in a profane and disgusting way. He's intentionally going against the person instead of against the sin, meaning hate the sin, not the sinner. Then we have a problem. Then in reality, your zealousness is not zealousness for Hashem. Your zealousness is just an excuse to practice arrogance. It's not a mitzvah. It's not a mitzvah at all. You're not helping anyone. All you're doing is you're just making people disgusted by the Torah because they think you have it. So you're becoming a Chilul Hashem. In reality, you haven't learned anything. And your tshuva is fake. And you're a faker. That's really what it is. If you're yelling at people and cursing them out and angry at them and so on and so forth, you're doing everything we just said, it was better off you never did tshuva. So now, a person needs to understand it's not easy to do tshuva for anger or for anything. It's not easy. Which means that you have to give yourself some serious repercussions if you get angry. One strategy that my rabbi suggested is a person needs to, every time he exercises anger in an in a, in a inappropriate way, by cursing, by screaming, by punching, by doing something like I just said a million times, every time he does it, he should know that Arizal, said he's supposed to fast 150 times for one moment of anger. Now, we know you're not going to fast 150 times or even one and a half times. But how do we stop you from getting angry? He said, take $100 and put it in a stock box. Every time you get angry. Take $100 or whatever is relevant to you that's a lot of money. If you put $1, you're going to get angry all day. You're going to become more angry than you started. Say, oh, it's angry. It's, come on, I have to murder somebody else. I'm going to be five bucks. Ah, no problem. Five, here you go. Guy okay, me. Meaning, put something significant. Put a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. Whatever is significant. Whatever is significant. I think a hundred dollars for most people is, is significant, unless you're very rich. And for, in that case, you put ten thousand, twenty thousand, hundred thousand with Bezat Hashem, Abel. <laughs> so, put a hundred bucks in its stocker box. Why? You'll start seeing. Your anger, run away. Why? Because now the anger officially has a price. It officially has a price that you can see. Now I can tell you what anger has, what price anger has on Olam Abba. Anger, angry people have a special section in Gehenom. Special section in Gehenom. They meant. They have a special section in Gehenom. Why? Because all of anger comes from, from arrogance. And arrogance, someone that's arrogant, someone that's prideful, is considered to'evat Hashem. It's considered disgusting to Hashem. 
Even in Gehenom, Hashem doesn't want him next to him. You have a special section. Go, go over here. Go in that section. All these disgusting people. You have the lawyers over next to you. Right there. Go, over there. So, a person that's, a person that's angry needs to understand that if he learned Torah, he could lose it all in a minute. All the Torah that he learned his whole life, 50 years of Torah, he could lose it in a second. He could lose it in a second. Hashem we, we learned last week that Eliav, the brother of David the Melech, was originally supposed to be the Mashiach. He lost the right to be the Mashiach because he got angry at David. We see that anger uh, from Yitzchak Avinu. Yitzchak grew old and his eyes dimmed and he couldn't see. So this, from here we learn that this anger causes loss of sight. Why? Because the wives of Esav were a source of bitterness for Yitzchak and Rivka. And after, uh, after this, it says Yitzchak got old. Yitzchak got old after he saw the, the wives of, of uh, Esav. What does it mean? Yitzchak got mad. Yitzchak Avinu, Kodesh Kodeshim, a living Sefer Torah, got upset. A normal thing. His son married two prostitutes. What do you want him to be happy about it? You got angry? Hashem says, I took his vision for that. And instead, what we're talking about, meaning a person needs to understand. If Hashem judged Moshe Rabbeinu like this, Yitzchak Avinu like this, David Melech like this, Eliav like this, all of the giants in history, he judged them like this. He took away so much from them. For getting angry once, twice, three times. And we get angry once, twice, three times every hour. What do you think is going to happen to us? We don't have their mitzvot. We don't have their kedusha. We don't have anything. What do you think is going to happen to us? Rabbi Yoshua, the son of uh, Nechmani. Nechmani. He says, four things cause a person to age prematurely. Fear. Anger to its children, a bad wife, and wars. So a person, you see a person starts getting some wrinkles. Why? You're a little angry. It's one of the reasons. He uses the source from Shmuel. Shmuel 2.2. 2. Also, there's three types of people lead, this fa- the, uh, lead lives that are considered disfa- dissatisfactory to Hashem. People that are very, uh, very upset often, they have miserable lives. Gemara Masechet Psachim, page 113. Rava said that if two Torah scholars live in the same city, but are not pleasant to each other, they're inciting rage and will cause anger to come, come down on them. Meaning just not being nice to each other is a form of anger. If you're two chachamim, you live in the same city, but you're not studying together. No, no, no. Him? I don't like him. No, him? He's having shiur? No, no. I'm not going there. Why not? He's a big tamid chacham. Nah, not for me. Not for me. In Shemaim, they got angry over that. It brings angry, much anger to the whole world for such things. Rabbi Yochanan says, all types of genom rule over a person who becomes angry. As we learned from Kohelet 11, Koelet uh, is uh, Ecclesiastes. And remove anger from your heart and remove evil from your flesh, it says. Evil refers to Geinom. As we learn from Proverbs 16, Mishle, all the handiwork of Hashem was for His sake and the wicked one for the day of evil. Every sin has a specific part of Geinom that relates to it. An angry person lacks control over his actions and may consequently violate all of the sins. Therefore, he does not have a specific punishment in Gehenom because all the types of Gehenom rule over him, meaning he goes everywhere. He has all the departments. He's in the first chamber, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the seventh one, and he never leaves. Why? He made all the sins because he never did chew up for anger. At some point... He went, with an, he went with a married woman. At some point, he this, he cheated here, he stole here, he worshipped an idol, all the different things. Why? Anger. An angry person will be afflicted in the lower parts of his body, meaning he will get intestinal problems and hemorrhoids. Two-thirds of people have hemorrhoids, by the way. 
as it says in Hashem, will give you an angry heart, disappointing eyes and a pain of your soul. In uh, Deuteronomy 28. What disappoints the body and pain in the soul, this refers to the afflictions of the lower body. Anger causes a person's internal heat to rise, which burns the food in the body in an abnormal manner. This causes illness in the intestines and lower areas. This is by the Shitami Kubetzit. Rabba, the son of Rav, Ravuna, says that a pers- when a person's angry, even the divine presence is not important to him. A person's angry, even to listen, but Hashem doesn't like it. Ah, he curses Hashem. This is actually where we learn this from. We learn this from the son of Shlomit, the son of Shulamit. And two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we learned this guy, his mom got raped by an Egyptian. She had him. Now that means that he didn't have a father that was a Jew, which meant that there's no tribe that he belongs to. She was the tribe of Dan, but you don't go and pick the tribe based on the mom. So he went to the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan said, listen, you're not part of us. He went to a different tribe and said, hey, hey, you're not part of us. So he got so angry, what did he do? He cursed Hashem. He cursed Hashem, people heard him, they arrested him. Moshe Rabbeinu went to Hashem, what do we do with this guy? He says, kill him in front of everyone. Yeah, but he got angry, his mom, it's not his fault. Hey, hey, hey. What happened to his mom is something. What happened to the tribe is something. But nothing justifies him cursing Hashem. Nothing. Nothing justifies it. A person that's angry can easily curse Hashem. The wicked man in his arrogance and rage will not seek out others. Even Hashem is not important to him in all of his plotting. This is in uh, Tehilim. A person can easily, Gemara Masechet Nedarim says, page 22b, says a person that becomes a, uh, angry can easily become a heretic in a second. Deny the existence of Hashem. Ah, Hashem doesn't care about this. Saying Hashem doesn't care about this, you're a heretic, you're a fish that fail. Saying that Hashem doesn't care about something, or Hashem is not here, or Hashem, anything like that, makes you a kofel. That if the Sanhedrin was witnessing, they're witnessing, they'll kill you on the spot. No trial. So, it's a big deal, Rabbi Tai, this whole book. I mean, is, I could read this for the next 10 years. I mean, you understand, the point is, is that it's, 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 it's an expensive sin. Wow. Says here, Rav Nachman, the son of Yitzchak, said, a person who becomes angry has more sins than merits. And it says in uh, Proverbs 29, a man of rage has the majority of sins. Could they or, or would they? Hundred percent. Rabbi Akiva says in Avot Rabbi Natan chapter three, a person who throws his bread to the ground and scatters his money will not leave this world until he needs the help of others. Meaning, a guy gets upset. Let's say I don't know, he lost the money, or uh, he didn't like the food. His wife made him some food. He didn't like it. He didn't have enough salt in it. He didn't have enough flavor. And it was not hot enough. And he took it. He became in a moment of rage. He took the plate and flipped it. Took the plate and flipped it. Or he took the piece of bread and threw it. It's a piece of bread. He didn't throw it at anybody. He just threw it. Rabbi Akiva says he will not finish his life. He will not fin- Hashem will not allow him to die before he becomes a beggar. Begging for that food. Yeah, but it, was, it wasn't hot. Okay, you'll see hot. Watch, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, but it wasn't good. Okay, you'll, we'll, we'll show. We'll, we'll see the, the, the food you can eat in the street. You'll see if that tastes better than the, your wife's food that toiled all day for it. Complaining about food. For, guys complain. Guys, men that complain about food to their wives, honestly, I don't know where, which world you came from. The woman toiled all day, worked all day to make you food, and you have the right to complain. What is the matter with you people? I don't understand. What does she work for you? 
What do you think? She's an employee. Even if you go to a restaurant, even if you go to a restaurant and the food's not good, you're not allowed to complain. You're not allowed to complain. Just say, listen, it's not my team. You fix it. You do something. Don't complain to them. Ah! You're on, ah! Start yelling at people. Where do you think you are? Where do you think you're, you're, you're on your high horse over here? Everybody has to serve you? And this is somebody you're paying. Needless to say, your wife, that you're not paying her anything. You owe her everything. You owe her your life. She made you food and you complain about it? It's not hot enough. It doesn't have enough this. It's not this. Oh, you know, I don't like it. You don't like it. Go cook yourself. Go cook your hand. Go, there's a few uh, rats walking outside. Go cook them. Go cook yourself with them. What's the matter with you people? I don't understand. Guys that complain to their wives about food, where'd you learn your manners? In a zoo? Anyone that gives you anything in life, say thank you. Even if you don't want it, say thank you. Learn how to say thank you because the world doesn't owe you anything. Not your wife, not your... No one owes you anything. No one owes you anything. Even the guy that owes you money doesn't owe you anything. Why? It's not your money anyway. It's Hashem's money. Hashem will decide if he pays you or not. You're not allowed to go chase after a guy that owes you money and make him feel bad. You're not allowed. If you know he doesn't have it, if you know he doesn't have the money, you're not even allowed to ask him for it. As a matter of fact, the Torah says, if somebody owes you money and you know he doesn't have it, and you're on the street and you see him coming, cross the street. Why? You're not allowed to embarrass him just because he owes you money. You're not allowed to make him feel uncomfortable just because he owes you money. Meaning that you cannot be a decent human being without the rules of the Torah. Because these things that I'm telling you, you're not going to think about logically. You're not gonna, your logic will never arrive at that. Why? Because you think you gave the guy 20 bucks, you gave the guy 20,000, you gave the guy 20 million, he owes you his life. No! He doesn't owe you anything. He took some material from you, he'll give it back to you when the, right, when the time is right. When Hashem decides. He doesn't owe you his kavod, he doesn't owe you his blood, he doesn't owe you any. He took some material from you that Hashem gave you anyway, that you're borrowing yourself. You know, you have no right to embarrass him. So that's, that's Rabotai, all of these things that a person thinks logically, if it's his opinion, it's wrong. By default. By default, it's wrong. So this book is full of it. There's other books. I mean, it's literally, this book is like, it's, it's, it's a mamash, it's like a genius, because he took sources from everywhere, from the Gemara, from the Zohar, from the... Uh, Mishnah from everywhere. He took everything. That's why all of the Chachamim said this is like this. This is the greatest thing in the world. Why? Because you literally have everything in one place, in an easy format, which will teach you in a very short period of time. Even if you have five minutes to learn, in five minutes you understand clearly how expensive it is to be angry. You understand the cost of being angry. In this world and the next. Now, as you were saying before, there is a time that a person cannot control his anger. So what does he do? Until he does tshuva. So somebody came to a big rabbi once. He told him, listen, I can't, uh, I can't handle it. My wife, she's like a little haman. She gets me angry all the time. I don't know what to do. I know anger is bad. Do, do, do. Kodarav, please help me. He said, okay, no problem. I got something for you. What do you got? I got this holy water. Oh, Kodarav, you're going to share it with me? Yeah, yeah, I got the holy water just for you. Okay, so what do I do? What do I do? He's like, listen, I'm going to go get the water. Takes 15 minutes, comes back. Little tiny little bottle of water. He's like, this water. It's very special water. As soon as you come into the house, if she's home, if she's home, as soon as she says something and it gets you angry, immediately take the water, take the water, and don't swallow it. Just leave it in your mouth. How long for the rab? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, I can do it. You think it's going to work? I know it's going to work. 
A month later, the guy comes back to the rabbi. He goes, Kvod Rav, I don't know what you have in that water. It's the greatest water in the world. This is amazing. I need more of it. I need to distribute it. We need to send it everywhere. We need to market it. We need to start websites, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts. We need to sell it everywhere. Kvod Rav, my wife is mamash an angel. I don't know what you did with her because I was the one drinking the water. But she turned into an angel. And I wanted to bring her to you. And uh, she's saying, look, everything changed. She's so happy. No, my husband, he's a little Moshe Rabbeinu now. I love him. I do. Ah, where'd you get this water? He said, what? The faucet, faucet right there. What, what do you mean the faucet? You blessed it? He said, no, you blessed it. You blessed it when you listened to me. He goes, what do you mean? He says, I knew that your wife, God bless her, she likes to talk. And really, she just wants somebody to listen. She doesn't really care about what you say. She just wants, to listen, wants you to listen. And you never listen. You have your own opinion. So that's what happens. She wants to talk. She's waiting the whole day. You're at work. She's taking care of the kids. She's waiting, 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 waiting all day to, to t- tell you what's happening on a day. The kid broke here. The t- uh, he did this. He jumped here. He did this. All day she's waiting, 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 waiting for you to come home. Finally you get home and she wants to tell you everything and you don't want to listen to her. You don't want to listen to her. So you say something. She says something. All of a sudden, you guys get into a fight. So I figured out a solution. What? Be quiet for 15 minutes. If you have water in your mouth for 15 minutes, that means you can't talk. If you don't talk, that means you have to listen. If you listen, she's happy. If she's happy, you're going to be happy eventually. It's an easy solution. Even if you know the story, you should still practice this. Even if you know the story, you should still practice this. Why? Because sometimes you just got to be a listener. But the same token, Abutai, is that there is a time that you are allowed to be angry, but you have to be angry in a specific way. The Rav Mibrisk, Rav Yosef Zeb, excuse me, Slovachik, Alava Shalom, one time somebody asked him a question, an Allahic question. He was a genius. Kodesh Kodeshim. And, uh, his son, his young son, answered the question. Like right off the cuff, knew the answer. It was a simple question. It wasn't like uh, the greatest uh, thing, but to him it was simple. To us, probably don't even know the question. But his son answered right away. Toot! Guy answered the question. It was like Google. So the Rav, if you were a father and your son, somebody asked, a, somebody asked you a question, a lachic question, difficult, easy, doesn't make a difference. And your son answers the question, young son, answers the question right over off the top of my head without checking nothing, answers, and it's right. It's the correct answer. What do you do? Oh, Hashem. What a good father I am. Look what kind of son I have. Kapara Alecha. What a son I have, Tzadik. He's a little Moshe Rabbeinu. Come, come, Rabbi Akiva. Come, come. You start calling your son Rabbi Akiva all of a sudden. Why? Because your son answered the question off the top of his head. He's a genius, right? You're so proud of yourself. You call your wife, oh, honey, we're such good parents. We have a little Rabbi Akiva in the house. Somebody asked the question. He knew the, he knew the answer right off the top of his head. He knew it. He knew the page number. He knew everything right off the top of his head. That's what you do, right? I know that's what I would do. We're all wrong. We're all wrong. What did the Rabbi Brisk say? He didn't say much. He slapped him. He slapped his son. So that's how you answer questions? You don't even check? You're so sure that you're right that you're going to decide life or death for another person eternally off the top of your head? You didn't want to check in the book? You didn't want to check with the rabbi? You didn't want to think about it for a little bit to toil with it? To treat it like it's Torah, like it's life or death? Because it is. You just, off the cuff, you just answer the guy. The guy could literally go to Gainom forever if you're wrong. But you didn't even take it into account? That's not Torah. What you have is not Torah, he says to him. It's not Torah. Don't be so impressed with someone that's able to answer you off the cuff. 
be impressed with someone that gives some consideration to your question and gives you a reason of why it's yes or no. He thought about it. It's thought out. He's taken into consideration that realistically, it's life or death. That's Torah. That's Torah. So there's a time where you're allowed to be angry. When it comes to Torah, you're allowed to be angry on certain things, but not angry to the sense where you're uh, violent and, uh, and, and, uh, and abusive. But, you know, angry in a sense that you're showing even your own students. That you're upset, even though internally you're really not. Why? Because if you see your students joking around and making a mockery of the Torah, both Rabbi Udana Si and the Rambam said in different places, obviously, lived in different times, that you're supposed to be. You're supposed to tell them that. You're supposed to talk stern. So now... You're supposed to show them a face as if you're angry, but not really be angry. Why? Because if you don't, you could jeopardize all of their learning from that moment forward. They'll think that they could just do whatever they want, and there's no consequences. So this leads us back to the original question that we asked. What do you do in the real world when you have annoying colleagues, annoying employees, Annoying partners, people that are just annoying, people that just make anybody angry. Even even the local cat, the local street cat is angry at them. Like people that are just, they like to make people angry. There are certain people like that, that they like to get under people's skin. What do you do with them? First and foremost, know that the only reason why you have them in your life is because Hashem is sending them to you. Again, the only reason why you have them in your life, these annoying people, is because Hashem is sending them to you. Why? It's a gift. Again, why do you have them in your life? Because Hashem is sending them to you. Why? It's a gift. The annoying people that curse me out online, the annoying people that make all types of annoying things in the shiurim, before, after, online, public, private, all of that, it's a gift. Why is it a gift? It's allowing you to work on yourself. Now, you can learn Torah from here until you turn blue in the face. But the reality is, Torah is not just to read. Torah is to practice. You cannot just read a book and think you're a tzaddik. You have to practice what you read. So you can learn Musar all you want. But unless you practice it, it's worthless. So Hashem says, oh, you learned Masilat Yisharim? Good job, good job. Okay, I'm going to send you somebody that's going to punch you in the face. Let's see what happens. You punch him back. Oh, what book did you read? What are you doing? Meaning, Hashem says, okay, he's learning, great. He's learning, great. He's doing tshuva, great. Okay, so I'm going to get you to actually implement some of this stuff. It says you're not supposed to be angry. So what is he going to do? How do I know you're not going to be angry? I'll send you somebody that's going to make you angry. I'll send you somebody that's going to cut you off. I'll send you somebody that's going to steal your lunch. I'm going to send you angry somebody that's going to make comment about you on the internet. I'm going to send you people to make you angry to see if you actually passed the test. To see if any of the teaching actually went into here, into here, into here, into everything. If it didn't, go back to the books. So first and foremost, you should know that Hashem is sending you these annoying people as a gift to help you implement the Torah, but also to get you to check yourself if you're really learning or not. And the reason why is because if a person is learning Torah, if a person is learning Torah with a rabbi for five years, and he hasn't advanced, meaning he's still an angry gremlin, he's still cheap as can be, he's still arrogant thinking he's, uh, you, know, the, you know, God's gift to man, he still has all of his bad character traits, the Rambam says that he must change direction. How, where do we learn it from? Also this week's parasha. In parashat Baal in chapter 8, verse 23, 24, 23 and 24, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, this shall apply to the Levites. From 25 years of age and up, he shall join the legion of service of the tent of meeting. From 50 years of age, 
he shall withdraw from the legion of work and no longer work. So Rashi and the Rambam both say the same thing, and that someone that Rashi says that someone that has not shown, from here we learn that someone that has not shown any success after five years of study has only a slim chance of attaining his goal. And the Rambam continues, however, the uh, five years of apprenticeship that the person has with a, uh, yeah, if he studied with a rabbi for five years, then obviously he has, to, uh, he has to change. He has to make a certain change. So the point being is that if you're learning Torah and it's not going into real life, then you have to make a change. If you're learning with some rabbi, whoever it is, and you're seeing that five years you're still the same gremlin, nothing has changed, you have to change a teacher. If you see that you read the book over the last five years and none of it has actually impacted your life, you have to get a new book. If it's taking you five years to read the book, then you have a problem. Um, the point is, Abutai, is that there is a time and a place for everything. There is a certain rules to everything. You can't just continue doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. There has to, you have to have certain, certain uh, rules. Now, the... Um, the people around you that are making you angry, it's a way for Hashem to make sure that you are going to double-check yourself because you're going to see some things that you're not going to ask yourself naturally. Like, for example, you're not going to ask yourself naturally, am I progressing or not? Because the way that we measure our progress is very differently than what we're supposed to. You know, for example, pe people measure their success based on money. But that's not right. That's not the right way to measure your success. Your success should be based on, on stability. Because even if you're making a lot of money, if your company or your business or your career or whatever it is is unstable, then you haven't achieved the success that you thought that you achieved. Because, for example, just like, uh, like me, I made a ton of money, and, but unfortunately, I never achieved stability. Because even though it was a lot of money, a lot of money doesn't mean stability. A lot of money just means a lot of money means you're a high income earner but stability is something that takes a lot more than just money it's strategy it's the way you implement things it's safety measures and so on and so forth so a person needs to know that the way that they measure them, their own success typically is wrong so Hashem is going to help you so your tshuva the way you measure it is by the way you look people think that if they wear a tzitzit with the uh, blue string on it they're uh, they're uh, religious or if they learn a little bit of uh, Gemara in the morning, they're religious. Or if they knew, know a few halachot by heart, they're religious. No. What makes you religious is you've become, you've implemented the Torah into your life to make yourself a better human being. And it's continuing to make you a better human being. It hasn't stagnated. Torah that's alive is Torah that's moving. It's Torah that's progressing. It's Torah that continues to improve you. If your Torah is no longer moving you, that means you've stopped learning. That means that whatever you're doing is maybe keeping you alive, but it's not. you're not getting to the right direction that way. Yeah? He, he, implemented anger, he implemented his zealousness in a wrong way. Yes, he was too zealous. He was too zealous, and that's why Hashem said, go back to the cave. Now, the, uh, the Ramban writes a letter. This letter, in my opinion, and I think in anybody's opinion, is one of the most important letters that was ever written in, in the world. Now, this is a book. It's $3. It's $3. It's called Igeret the Ramban. You buy it from Archcrow. And uh, I don't know what shipping is. Maybe it's free. They have some of their programs or whatever it is. And maybe it's not. Whatever it is, the book itself is 3 bucks. The letter, you can get online for free. But why do you still buy the book? Because the book was something that was real genius. That Rav Fuhr actually took each one of the sentences of this letter that the Ramban wrote to his son. And he gave commentary on it. 
with sources from the Torah, with stories, and so on. It's a very famous book. This is not the first time anybody's heard of it. But anyway, this is something that you really should have in your pocket 24 hours a day. On Shabbat, if, as long as you live in a Yeruv, instead of walking and doing nothing, looking into emptiness, instead of walking to Shul a mile or half a mile, however long, if you have a long walk, this is what I do. I read a book. I read a lot of books on the way to, on the way to Shul. Why? Why waste time? Why are you looking at the floor the whole time? Read a book. Do something useful with your time. Same thing with every day. Want to learn Musar? Take a page. Take two pages. Each chapter is two pages. Each chapter is like one or two or three words or one verse or something like that. And it gives you commentary and it's real serious Musar. The point is, Rabotai, is that it's not expensive to, to, to work on yourself. It's not expensive. It's actually expensive not to work on yourself. So this letter is really all a person needs to learn in order to understand that not working on himself is expensive. Because the Ramban writes, even if you understand this literally, I'm going to read the, word, the, the letter literally, and then I'll give you a little bit of insight, and then we'll finish. The Ramban writes to his son, Heed my son, meaning, listen. Listen to me. Heed my son, the discipline of your father, and do not forsake the guidance of your mother. This is actually a verse in Proverbs 1 8. Accustom yourself to speak gently to all people at all times. This will protect you from anger. Right off the bat. Right off the bat, he's talking to you about why. Why? Why is this? Why? Why? Why is he mentioning anger? How come he's not talking about. Uh, Jealousy. How come he's not talking about stinginess? How come he's not talking about being dirty? How come he's not talking about all the other things? There's so many different bad midot. Why is he mentioning anger? This will protect you from anger, a most serious character flaw which causes one to sin. And this is the root of all evil. The root of all evil starts with anger, which itself starts from arrogance. But you're not going to admit you're arrogant. Because everybody thinks they're Moshe Rabbeinu. But you're not going to deny you're angry. Anger is easier to pinpoint. Our rabbis taught whoever flares up in anger is subject to the discipline of Gehenom. As it is written, banish anger from your heart and remove evil from your flesh. The evil mentioned here refers to Gehenom. Apparently, Ramban believed in Gainom also. He's going to have a debate with the people from this generation. As it is written, and the wicked are destined for the day of evil. What's evil? Evil is Gainom. Once you have distanced yourself from anger, the quality of humility will enter your heart. Meaning, only once you've actually started working on your anger does your tshuva actually begin. Then we can talk about humility and generosity and all the other things. That's according to the Ramban over here. Why? As long as you're still angry, you're probably still making a lot of really big sins. So even though you may be making a few mitzvot, you keep Shabbat, you keep kosher, you keep talat mishpahai, you keep a few other things, but if you haven't even started working on your anger and controlling yourself, you're probably making so many sins, it's at least balancing your mitzvot. Meaning you haven't really progressed that as much as you think, if at all. So that's why he starts with anger right off the bat. He says, once you've distanced yourself from anger, the quality of humility will enter your heart. This sterling quality is the finest of all admirable traits. Meaning humility. Humility is the best midah to have. As scripture writes, on the heels of humility come the fear of Hashem. This is, uh, we learned this in the past, Proverbs 22, 4, where it says on the heels of humility, uh, uh, where am I? On the heels of humility comes the fear of Hashem, meaning that if you're humble, you'll, you'll arrive at Yirat Shemaim. Through humility, the fear of God will intensify in your heart, for you will always be aware of from where you have come and from where you are destined to go. As you can see, every single Sentence is a verse from the Torah. 
There's no opinion here. This is all verse from Mishle, from uh, from uh, from uh, Ecclesiastes, from Pirkei Avot, from the Gemara. There's no opinion here. It's one verse after another, just put in a structured way. It's genius. Through humility, the fear of God will intensify in your heart, for you will always be aware from where you have come and where you are destined to go. You will realize that in life, you are as frail as the maggot or the worm, all the more so in death. It is this sense of humility which reminds you of the one before you will be called for judgment. The one before whom you will be called for judgment. The King of glory. Of Him it is written, Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. Surely not the hearts of men. Furthermore it is written, Do I not fill the earth, the heaven and the earth, says Hashem? After you give serious thought to these ideas, you will stand in awe of your Creator and will be guarded against sin. Once you have acquired these fine qualities, you will indeed be happy with your lot. You want to achieve happiness? Two steps. One, stop being angry. Two, become humble. Stop being angry already will eliminate all of your complaining. Only people that are angry at the world complain. If you're not an angry person, you're just naturally not going to complain. Complaining is a form of anger. Complaining is a form of anger. You don't have to yell and scream in order to be angry. If you're just generally complaining, that means you're angry at something. So you want to be happy? Stop complaining. Stop complaining. Understand that everything that's happening to you is midah kineged midah. It's measure for measure. Hashem is doing it. No one else. Once you actually stop complaining, automatically you'll become humble. You'll start appreciating what you do have. Once you've done that, you achieve happiness. Real happiness. Not uh, superficial garbage happiness. When your actions display genuine humility, when you stand meekly before man and fearfully before God, when you stand worry of sin, then the Spirit of God's presence will rest upon you. As will the splendor of His glory, you will live the life of the world to come. In essence, He's telling you this is one of the keys. It's not the only thing, but this is one of the keys to achieve Ruach HaKodesh, which we'll talk about more tomorrow, Bezat Hashem. The other keys. But in essence, if you haven't achieved this, if you're still an angry person, you have zero chance of achieving Ruach HaKodesh. If you're still not humble, if all you talk about is all of your achievements and how wonderful you are, you still have no Ruach HaKodesh. God's presence will rest upon you and will the splendor of His glory. You will live the life of the world to come. And now, my son, understand clearly the one who is prideful in his heart towards other men, rebels against the sovereignty of heaven, for he glorifies himself in God's own robes. For it is written, Hashem reigns, he dons the mantle of grandeur. Meaning that a person that's prideful, it's like somebody that stole the robe from the king and pretends to be the king. It's such a joke. What are you so prideful about? You make it like you're the one that made the money. You make it like you're the one that made you good looking. You make it like you're the one that made anything in life. You're making it like you're not going to become something, the piece of meat that goes into a uh, three by six box one day that maggots are going to use for lunch and dinner. What makes you think that you're so wonderful? For indeed, of what should man be prideful? If he has wealth, it is Hashem who makes him prosperous. And if it's honor, does honor not belong to God? As it is written, Wealth and honor come from you. How can one glorify himself with the honor of his maker? If he takes pride in wisdom, let him understand that God may remove the speech of the most competent and take away the wisdom of the aged. This is something I try to remind myself as often as possible. That anytime somebody tells me, wow, he's such a good speaker, I said, yeah, Baruch Hashem. It has nothing to do with me. Why? It really doesn't have anything to do with me. What do you think, speaking is me? 
Speaking has nothing to do with me. If Hashem wants, speaking will be eliminated in a second. Forget about the ability to speak in regards to speak well, make things connect, say this, say that. Forget. Just literally the ability to speak just could go away. A person could have a Shem Echem stroke, that's it, he can't talk anymore. What are you so proud of? Oh, he's a good salesman. Good, okay, sell yourself now. As a mute. Thus, all men stand as equals before their Creator. In his fury, he casts down the lofty. In his goodwill, he elevates the downtrodden. Therefore, humble yourself, for Hashem will lift you. You actually want to get to be somebody? Start realizing you're a nobody. We're not saying nobody like you're a loser and no one likes you and you're smelly too. No, we're not saying insult yourself. There's no, there's no mitzvah of insulting and abusing yourself. Humility does not mean that. Humility means know where you stand. Don't be one of these people that says, No, Hashem, Chatanu, Avinu, Pashanu, Hashem, you know, your greatest, Afar Ba'efer, I'm dust by ashes, and this and that. And as soon as somebody uh, does something you don't like, you start, Hey, you know who I am? You know, hey, hey, didn't you just say in a tefillah, you're, you're dust and ashes and everything? He goes, No, I'm dust and ashes in front of him, not you. You're a plumber. What are you? What are you? What, what do you think you are? You're thinking a person is saying, I'm dust, I'm ashes, I'm nothing. He thinks he's comparing himself to Hashem. Well, you think Hashem needs you to compare yourself to Him? Is this really a comparison? He's saying you're dust and ashes next to every man. You're nothing. That's what you're supposed to say. Dust, dust, you're saying you're dust to Hashem? Thanks. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Well, you're so humble. You're like a second uh, version, uh, a 2.0 to Moshe Rabbeinu. You think Hashem, you think that's humility? You think you're dust next to Hashem? No, next to everybody else. Stop being so uh, so uh, arrogant. Think you're somebody. Thus, I shall explain to you how you may accustom yourself to the quality of humility. To walk with it always. Let your words be spoken gently. Let your head be bowed. Cast your eyes downwards. Always look down. Don't be one of these people that has a high head like this. Always look, you know, walks around like this. You know, people walking around like they're, they're looking for birds on trees or something. Don't be one of those people. Look down. Why? That's in essence. That causes you physically to become humble. Physical is, is something that leads to the uh, mental state of mind. In essence, you're, uh, you're conscious to the subconscious. Cast your eyes downwards, your heart, your heart, your heart heavenwards. When speaking, do not stare at your listener. Don't be one of these people. Really? You know, some people are like, hi, hi, they're looking you right in the eyes. Don't be one of those people. I don't know why some people do it. It's so distracting. I remember in the business world, it's, I don't know, it tended to be women. I don't know why. It tended to be women. But they look at hi, hi, and they're looking straight in the eyes. Like you feel like they have a laser. Hi, hi. Like, Whoa, relax. Hi. So don't be one of those people. Don't be one of those people. I don't know why people do that. Apparently, it's a uh, Rambam knew about it also. Rambam. Let all, uh, uh, yeah, because also if you stare at people, you make them feel uncomfortable. Let all men seem greater than you in your eyes. If another is more wise or wealthy than yourself, then you must show him respect. That's easy, though. If he's smarter than you and he's wealthy than you, why are you not going to show him respect? In essence, he's telling, don't be a hater. Don't be a hater because he has more money than you. Don't hate him because of that. Because he's smarter than you, don't write things against him. Don't be a hater. Hashem doesn't like haters. Because jealousy, just so you know, a person that's jealous does not have the ability to be resurrected with the dead. Anyone that dies, a jealous person, no resurrection of the dead. They keep Shabbat, keep Talat Mishpacha, keep everything else. They cannot be resurrected with the dead if they're jealous. Meaning that as long as you're talking about other people's money, you will not be resurrected. Just so you know. Oh, that conversation. What did it cost you, that conversation? Talking about LeBron James' money and your neighbor's house and the expansion of the company of a company that's competing with you. You talked about it. What did it just cost you? It cost you resurrection of the dead. That's the price. It cost you. Why? You're a jealous person. Why are you talking about their money? There's a price for everything. Abotai is a price. You should know it. That's how it gets us to stop, talking about shtuyot. 
So now it says, if someone is wise and wealthy than you, then show him respect, meaning don't be a hater. But what about if it's more difficult? It says, and if he's poor, and you are richer and or wiser than him, meaning he's poor in money or poor in dot, in, in, in brain. What if he's poor? What if you're wiser than he is? Consider that he may be more righteous than yourself. Meaning even if you're smarter than him, he's a bigger tzaddik than you. Even if you're richer than him, he's a bigger tzaddik than you. You give tzaddikah, he learns to love him. If he sins, he says, how can you do such a thing? How can you do such a thing? How do you get to that? To, how do you use your imagination to think like this? If he sins, it's the result of an error. While your transgressions are deliberate. Meaning, he's such a tzaddik, any sin he makes, it's accident. You, Rasha, you. You, you make your sins, you know you're sinning. You still do it. You have a big etzah, you. You have to get over it. In all your words and actions and thoughts, at all times, imagine in your heart that you are standing in the presence of the Holy One, blessed be He. This is, in essence, the root of everything. Once a person truly understands that he's standing in front of Hashem, immediately he has enough yirat shamayim, enough fear of the Almighty, that he stops sinning. At least not the big ones. Why? Because you have to literally be crazy to sin right next to your maker. And if you're crazy, you're patul anyway. You absolve from sin anyway. That His presence rests upon you, meaning think that Hashem is literally right here all the time. Indeed, the glory of Hashem fills the universe. Speak with reverence and awe like a servant who stands in the presence of his master. Always talk like your master is right next to you. When somebody, somebody's boss is next to them, they don't talk, yeah, yeah, they don't talk like that. Like, yeah, sir, sure, can't talk now, can't talk now, yeah, can't talk now. They get permission. Why? The boss is right there. The boss is right there. You're not going to talk with your, like, macho self when your boss is right there. God is next to you. Why are you talking so macho? Think about these things. This is amazing. Act with restraint in the company of others. If one should call out to you, do not answer with a loud voice, but respond gently in low tones as one who stands before his mentor. Meaning somebody says, Hey, yo, you're coming? Don't be one of those people. Yeah, I'm coming. Oh, don't do that. You're not in the, in the market. You're not in the shuk. Why? God's next to you, you fool. Forget about the fact that he yelled at you. He said, hey, yo, like he, th- he may be in a shuk. He may be in the market. You're not. God's next to you. Always think, God's next to me. I can't talk like this next to him. He's here. He's next to me. He's right here. If you think like that, you know, you know, oh, yeah, I'll be there in a second. One second. He's here. One second. What are you doing? Why are you whispering? God's here. God's here. Why are you whispering? He's here. Shh. He's here. Take care to always study Torah diligently so that you will be able to fulfill its commandments. When you rise from study, ponder carefully what you have learned. Don't just be one of these people that learns the shield one time. Oh, yeah, I know everything. Yeah, yeah, I know everything you said. You come to the shield, the shield is full of sources. Study the sources. Study the shield multiple times. I tell people all the time, honestly, I remember when I first started studying shield, I still do it now to, to this day with my rabbi. When I study with him shiurim, we do shiurim, we do it a few times every week, Baruch Hashem, I write notes. Most of the people I go to, I tell them, write notes, write notes every week, it's the same thing, same advice, nobody listens. Two people are writing notes right now. Three people are writing notes right now. Why? What do you think you remember everything I say? I don't remember everything I'm going to say. Write notes, watch the shiur after again. Why? It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of information. If you're not writing notes, you're wasting your time. It's going to go here, it's going to leave there, you're maybe going to retain half a percent. Half a percent. Wasted three hours of your life. When you rise from study, ponder carefully what you have learned. See what there is in it which you can put into practice. Review your actions every morning and every evening. 
And in this way, live all your days in repentance. Meaning, do tshuva every day. How? At the end of the day, before you go to sleep, instead of watching sports or wasting your life, or eating like you've never eaten before, take 5, 10, 20 minutes and think, okay, what happened today? Ah, in the morning, I gave a finger to the guy. Yeah, that's not good. Okay. Uh, in the afternoon, I cheated somebody. Ah, yeah, that's not that good. Ah, and, uh, think about all those things. Uh, yeah, I made an excuse not to go to the shiu, but really it was just nonsense. I really could have gone to the shiu. I just didn't feel like it. Oh, uh, and I overslept, and over this, and over this. Think about all those things. Why? That's the only way you're going to do tshuva. Only way you're going to do tshuva. We're almost done. Cast external matters from your mind when you stand to pray. Careful, prepare your, carefully prepare your heart in the presence of the Holy One. Purify your thoughts and ponder your words before you utter them. In essence, he's telling you, don't become one of these robots that goes to synagogue. Think about what you're saying. Think about who you're standing next to. Think about who you're praying to. Remove your mundane from your head. Stop thinking about the stock market or your job or your clients or your wife or your kids or the food you're going to eat after or you ate before while you're studying Torah, while you're uh, praying to Hashem. Clean out your mind. Talk to Hashem. Ask for something meaningful, like a good memory so you can learn Torah. Knowledge of Torah so you could actually know Torah and actually teach it one day. People ask for money. People ask for shtuyot all day. Ask for something meaningful. Conduct yourself in these ways in all your endeavors for as long as you live. In this way you will surely avoid transgression. Your words, actions, and thoughts will be flawless. Your prayer will be pure and clear, sincere and pleasing to God, blessed be He. As it is written, when you prepare their heart to concentrate, you're attentive to their prayers. Read this letter once a week and neglect none of it. If he said neglect none of it 900 years ago, imagine today. Fulfill it, and in so doing, Walk with it forever in the ways of Hashem. May He be blessed, so that you may succeed in your ways and merit the world to come that lies hidden for the righteous. Every day that you, will, that you shall read this letter, heaven shall answer your heart's desires. Amen, Selah. This is Kodesh Kodeshim. A person that literally reads this letter every week, completely already by itself, if you understand the words, is already good. But I think taking it a step further is reading some of the commentaries and understanding the deeper meaning of each one of the verses. Now we just read the letter superficially. We understood a little bit. It's great. It's amazing. But once you understand the deeper meaning of each one of those verses of what's written in there, it changes your life. You should read this every day for the rest of your life. It's one of the favorites my wife and I have. And I'm telling you, this type of stuff is the only way it's the only way for you to eliminate anger and other bad character traits because it gets you to check yourself. It forces you to check yourself. And once you start checking, you realize you're not so great. You have to work on yourself. Now, being sick is not a problem. Denying that you're sick is a problem. Denying that you're sick is a problem. With that being said, Rabotai, understand that all of the difficulties that you have in your life, whether it be money or annoying people or whatever it is, it's Hashem doing it. It's Hashem doing it. One reason could be as punishment. Clear as simple day. You made bad sins, Hashem wants to punish you in this world. But a bigger and more useful way to think about it for us, if we're already doing tshuva, in order for us not to get depressed that we're the biggest sinners in the world, in order for us not to lose hope, is to realize that there's actually an even bigger purpose for all of those difficulties. The bigger purpose is that Hashem is giving you difficulty in order to put you, your Torah learning into training, into practice. You practiced the, uh, you know, theologically, theoretically, by reading about it by attending a lecture about it, by talking about it. Now you have to put it in practice. Why? 
Because just like no one here would ever want to go to a doctor that has been reading books for 25 years but never practicing. Hashem also doesn't want a Jew like that either. Hashem doesn't want a Jew that just reads books. He wants a Jew that actually puts the Torah into life. That when an actual opportunity to sin comes, he doesn't sin. When an opportunity to do mitzvah comes, he's excited about it. He chases the mitzvah and he runs away from the sin. So all of those difficulties, regardless of where they're coming from, is an opportunity for you to fulfill your potential. So stop complaining and say thank you. Say thank you for difficulties, Hashem. It means you're paying attention. You're paying attention to me, little old me, nothing me. Imagine, the king of kings, Melech Malchei Amlachim, is actually paying attention to you. Who are you for anybody to pay attention to? And he's paying attention to you. That alone you should be grateful for. That alone we should never complain about. The fact that he's even paying attention to us, that he cares about us, that he's even giving us an opportunity to earn anything good. That alone is amazing. What are you complaining about? This Rabotai is a way for us to really put things into practice. And like I said, sometimes theoretical is good, but it's not enough. So you have to put things into practice in a couple of other ways. Read about it constantly. Second thing is, Read about the cost of being angry constantly or anything bad constantly. Understand there's a cost for it both in this world and the next. And last but not least, do something about it. By doing something about it, I don't mean just read more. Because if you've been reading for five years and nothing changed, it means there's something wrong. Do something by actually punish yourself. Take money out of your pocket and put it in staka. Why? Because I know all of you are just like all other people in the world. You love money. Everybody loves money. They do. They want to die for money. They want to punch people in the face for money. They want to get embarrassed for money. There's some shows I remember a long, long time ago, people want to literally eat bugs for money or embarrass themselves publicly for money, being on these stupid shows, publicly embarrassing themselves. Why? For, for, for five bucks. For ten bucks, for a thousand bucks, for a million, whatever it is. Stupidity. So I know that's already in us. That's the Avodazara of this generation, money. So take that money and put it in a stock box. Why? Because you'll see that once you do, once you start putting a hundred bucks every time you're angry, once you put a hundred bucks every time you curse, once you put a hundred bucks every time you punch something, instead of punching it, you're still seeing, you know what? I could have already built a house. Could have already remodeled my uh, kitchen with all the money I'm uh, wasting away with my words. So you got to start putting it into practice. And Bezat Hashem, this will help us do tshuva for this. This will help me do tshuva for it. And all of you, Bezat Hashem.